first of all we will discuss the advent of ahoms so ahoms basically belong to the thai mao section of the greater thai race and this thai race actually they belong to the southeast asia region particularly thailand so as per the chronicles of ahom or the buronjis the ahoms were led by prince or saulung so in thai language prince is called saulung right so saulung sukafa left the maulung region in thailand in 1215 ad and with his there were number of followers around several nobles then officers of various ranks 9000 men and women and also children right then the huge group led by sukafa they crossed the patkai hills in the year 1228 ad and they set up their first territorial unit at khamjang valley that is located in present day nagaland and when actually sukafa and his followers entered the khamjang valley some naga tribe attempted to resist them but sukafa defeated the nagas and in fact he in turn launched atrocities on them right then following this actually all other naga tribes in that particular region they made submission to sukafa then after reaching the brahmaputra valley sukafa and his followers moved from one place to another in search of a better place which is suitable for rice cultivation because thai people are traditionally rice growing community so when they entered brahmaputra valley their first task was to find a place which is better for rice cultivation right then they stayed in several places like namrup dihing tipam habung ligiri gaon himologuri etc and all these regions were located in the upper assam region to the south of river brahmaputra right then on his way from one place to another sukafa has organized several other territorial units along the bank of rivers dihing and dikho so in the drainage chapter i have discussed that dihing dikho and also the dissang river they have historical importance particularly in relation to the ahom kingdom right so finally sukafa has established his capital at soraidu in 1253 ad so sukafa has entered assam in 1228 ad then finally he established a capital at soraidu in 1253 ad right so here you can see this is how sukafa founded a small ahom kingdom in 1228 ad right and his small kingdom was bounded by patkai hills and naga hills to the south buriding river in the east then brahmaputra river on the north and the dikho river in the west right so this particular kingdom before the ahoms or before the sukafa came it was mainly inhabited by morans and the borahi kosaris and also there were a few villages of sutia and kosaris so nagas were also included in the hilly region of this particular place right but sukafa was an enterprising and brave prince so actually he made judicious treatment to all the communities and in fact he won over the hearts of the chiefs of moran and bora borahis and he also encouraged intermarriage that means he encouraged marriage between his followers and the original inhabitants morans and borahis and also he appointed many morans and borahis in various capacities of his small kingdom right so basically sukafa had made friendship with the original inhabitants particularly the morans and borahis very very important information right uh, but sukafa was criticized for his atrocities on the naga people so although he made friendship with borahis and kosaris but he launched atrocities on naga people and the memory of wandering of sukafa is still preserved in various local names and traditions particularly in the upper assam region and soon after his entering into assam or brahmaputra valley sukafa appointed two great officers the first one is the borguhai and the second one is the burhaguhai so basically they were his ministers 
and Borguhai and Burhaguhai exercised power next to the king only. Right? And after a rule of 40 years, he had an eventful rule of 40 years. Sukafa finally died in the year 1268 AD. So, regarding Sukafa, please remember he entered Assam in 1228 AD. After crossing Patkai, he actually set up a unit at Nagaland. Then, finally, he established the capital in Soraideu in 1253 AD and finally he died in 1268, right? So this is regarding advent of Ahoms. Now let us discuss the early Ahom kingdom. So after the death of Sukafa, he was succeeded by his son Suteufa. Then uh, Suteufa actually occupied some parts of the Kosari kingdom to the east part of Dikho. And Suteofa also engaged in a war with the Nora Raja. Initially, Ahom army was defeated, but later, actually, they made terms or agreement with the Nora Raja. Then Suteofa finally died in 1281 AD. Right? Then Suteofa was succeeded by Subinfa or Subinafa. And Subinafa introduced some reforms in the Ahom administration. And he died in the year 1293 AD. Right? And then he was succeeded by the fourth Ahom king, Sukhangfa. And he ruled from 1293 up to 1332. And during his reign, the Ahoms engaged in a war with the ruler of Komata kingdom. And eventually, the Komata ruler made a peace treaty by offering a princess named Rajani. Right? And then Sukhangfa was succeeded by Sukhangfa in 1332. And during his reign, Prince Tao Sulai rebelled. Then Sukhrangfa died in 1364. And he didn't have any child, right? Or he didn't have any heir to his throne. So after his death, the nobles, nobles in uh, a home language, uh, they are called Dangoria, right? Dangoria means basically uh, the Buddha Guhai, Bor Guhai, etc. Right. So after his death, the nobles ruled Ahom Kingdom for few years up to 1369 for five years. Then in 1369, the nobles chosen Sutufa to the throne. But Sutufa got killed in a friendly encounter with the Chutia king. So this I have already mentioned in the lecture on Sutia Kingdom. Right. So Sutufa was a Ahom king which was killed by Sutia king. So when Sutufa was killed, he was succeeded by his brother Tau Khamti. And Tau Khamti ruled from 1380 to 1389. And he led a successful expedition against the Sutia king mainly to take the revenge of the killing of Sutafa. Right? Then Tau Khamti was succeeded by Sudangfa. And Sudangfa was popularly known as Bamuni Kwar because actually he was born and brought up for few years in a village or in a house of a Brahmin at Habung, right? Then Sudangfa's reign is very important from several aspects. So the first one is that during his reign, Ahom capital was shifted to Sorgwa that is located on the bank of river. So initially Sukafa uh, has established the capital in Soraideu. Then during the reign of Sudangfa or Bamuni Kaur, the capital was shifted to Sorgwa, right? Then during the reign of Sudangfa, actually the Brahminical influence had its entry to the Ahom royal palace. And some nobles were also dissatisfied because of his submission or actually because of his embracement to the Hindu religion and they reported it to the Thai ruler of Mongkwang or Moguang. So when actually the nobles reported against the Bamuni Kwar Sudangfa, the Thai ruler Mongkwang sent an expedition to annex the Ahom Kingdom. But Sukangfa, sorry, Sudangfa, he successfully resisted the attack and made a treaty. So by that particular treaty, Patkai was fixed as a boundary between the Assam and Mongkwang or Moguang. Right. Then Sudangka also successfully suppressed a revolt of the Tipomia. And he actually asserted his sovereignty over three eastern dependencies. These are Tipam, Aiton, and Khamzang. Right. So Sudangfa was a very powerful ruler.
Then after that, Ahom Kingdom was ruled by Suzangfa, Supukafa, and Supemafa. And they, they actually their reigns were comparatively peaceful from 1407 up to 1497. So this, this actually extends a period of 90 years. However, during that period, a brief war with the Dimasa Kosaris was fought in the year 1490. And at that time, the bordering Nagas also made some raids, but they were controlled. So it has been observed that from 13th to 15th century, the Ahoms were basically busy in consolidating the newly acquired territory of Ahom Kingdom and also they were busy in protecting it from the neighboring powers. Right. So the expansion of Ahom Kingdom didn't took place until 15th century. Right. So this is the early Ahom Kingdom up to the rule of Supemofa. Now let us discuss the expansion of Ahom Kingdom. So the real expansion of Ahom Kingdom began with the reign of Suhung Mung. And Suhung Mung was the most powerful ruler of Ahom Kingdom. And he ascended the throne in 1497 AD. Very important, there might be a direct question that in which year Suhung Mung ascended the Ahom throne. Then the answer will be 1497. But Suhung Mung was better known as Dihingya Raja and this is another information questions are typically asked like that which Ahom King was known as Dihingya Raja then the answer will be Suhung Mung and why he is called Dihingya Raja because he belonged to the Dihingya Foid or Dihingya clan of Ahom royal family and during his reign the Brahminical influence grew considerably in the Ahom court and in fact he has adopted the Hindu title Sorgo Narayan. Very important. Suhung Mung adopted the Hindu title Sorgo Narayan. Then he transferred his capital to Bokota on the bank of Dihing River. Then during the reign of Suhung Mung, the Hoko era was also adopted and he also conducted a census of population of his kingdom. Right. Uh, then now let us discuss the expansion, how Suhung Mung expanded the Ahom Kingdom. So in the year 1504 AD, the Aidonia Nagas, they revolted, right? But they were defeated by the Ahom army led by Borguhai and Burhaguhai. Uh, then Suhung Mung also annexed the Habung territory, right? Then in the year 1513 AD, Sutia King Dhir Narayan attacked Ahom Kingdom, but he was got defeated. But later in the battle of Dihing, Ahom got defeated and this I have mentioned in the lecture on Sutia kingdom, right? So here you can see actually different dynasties or different kingdoms of medieval period. They have a correlation, right? So you have to read it in a story like manner, right? So the fact memorizing is not possible in case of Assam history. So you cannot just uh, remember the fact and then you can answer in the exam. That is not possible. And that is why actually I am explaining the Assam history in a storytelling way, right? So anyway, after that, in the year 1524 AD, taking the advantage of the weakening Sutia kingdom, Suhung Mung conquered Hodia, right? Or Sutia kingdom. Then Sutia king Nitipal war or Nityapal was killed. And Suhung Mung annexed the Sutia territory into Ahom Kingdom. And he also placed a frontier officer title Hodia Kwa Guhai to administer that particular territory. Right? Then in the year 1525 AD, Suhung Mung appointed frontier officers to administer the frontier provinces like Habung, Dihing, and Bangalung. Then in 1527 AD, Muslim army led by Bor Uzir and Bit Manik attacked Ahom Kingdom. But they were defeated by Suhung Mung and in fact Bit Manik was killed. And it was the first Muslim invasion to Ahom Kingdom. So there might be a question that uh, during the reign of which Ahom King the first Muslim invasion took place then the answer will be Suhung Mung, right? Uh, but later another commander called Turbuk Turbuk again attacked Ahom Kingdom and he in fact ascended up to Hingori. Hingori is in present-day Sonitpur district and he ascended to Hingori with a huge force. 
and in the battle of hingori the ahom side got defeated and in fact the ahoms lost several of their general including frasang mung burhaguhai right so turbuk basically killed frasang mung burhaguhai and also a huge number of ahom soldiers and in that particular battle prince suklang mung was also severely wounded right or injured so in the year 1533 in a renewed war the ahoms defeated the army of turbuk in duimunikila and in that battle turbuk was killed and ahom had the victory and in that particular battle actually mulagavoru also bravely fought against the turbuk and mulagavoru was the wife of frasang mung burhaguhai right and the bravery and perseverance of mulagavoru actually caused them major damage to the enemy side and mulagavoru was also killed at particular battle right and actually the death of mulagavoru inspired many ahom soldiers and this was the main reason behind the victory of ahom side in that particular battle of duimunikila then after the battle of duimunikila a large number of arms cannons horses and also the soldiers of turbuk were captured by the ahoms and the captured uh, you know muslim soldiers later settled in ahom kingdom and they came to known as moriyas right and they were later engaged in the brass metal work right so moriya community is still present in assam and they had a relation with the turbuk they they are actually their forefather was were basically the soldiers of turbuk right then suhung mung also defeated the kosaris of the doyang dhonkiri valley and doyang dhonkiri valley basically it is located in the golaghat and karbianglang region right and after defeating uh, the kosaris actually suhung mung driven out the kosari royal family and that is why kosari royal family moved to maibong leaving dimapur right and after that suhung mung brought kosari territory under the ahom kingdom and he made it a province called morongi and an officer a frontier officer was uh, titled morongi khwaguhai he started administering the morongi so morongi is basically the annexed kosari territory then after some time the kosari king at maibong was given recognition as thapito honsito raja by suhung mung then suhung mung also brought under control the bhuyas on the north bank then the ahom army marched westward as far as korotua and thus by 1534 the ahom army liberated kamrup and kamata king so here you can see suhung mung was a very powerful ruler and he almost actually conquered most of the places around the ahom kingdom right so here we can see suhung mung extended the ahom dominion from khodia up to the korotua river in the west right so in the reign of uh, suhung mung actually the ahom kingdom got expanded to the great extent and suhung mung also established relation with the goro king and goro king offered two of his daughters to ahom kung suhung mung and kos king biswahingo have also offered presents to suhung mung and in fact envoys were also sent to orissa and manipur and presents were also exchanged so here you can see apart from conquering different kingdoms suhung mung has also established relation with as far as orissa manipur and also up to gaura right after an eventful reign of 42 years suhung mung finally died in the year 1539 So in the history of Ahom kingdom the rule of Suhung Mung is very very important right because he expanded the Ahom kingdom then Suhung Mung was succeeded by his son Suklang Mung right and he was better known as Gorgoya raja because he shifted his capital to Gorgaon Suhung Mung is known as Gorgoya raja because he shifted his capital to Gorgaon right very important please remember this information then during the reign of suklang mung there was a series of conflict between ahoms and the kos initially the kos army led by silarai defeated the ahoms but later suklang mung was able to defeat the kos army and during his reign the gorgaon tank was excavated and noga ali was also built 
and Suklang Mung was the first Ahom king to strike coins. Very, very important information and that is why I have made this line bold. Please remember this particular line. And Suklang Mung died in the year 1552 AD. Right? Then Suklang Mung was succeeded by Sukhangfa. And Sukhangfa was also known as Khura Raja or Lame because he got injured his foot while he was actually traveling uh, or he was hunting in elephant right and a plot was also formed against Sukhangfa by seven princes soon after his accession to the Ahom throne but all such princes all the rebel princes were caught and pardoned but they rebelled again in 1559 AD and uh, by that time all of them all the seven princes were put to death by Sukhangfa. Then in the year 1662 AD, Silarai attacked Ahom kingdom and he occupied Gorgao. Very important information. When Susilarai occupied Gorgao, then the answer will be 1662 AD. And Sukhangfa fled, right? And that is why Sukhangfa was also known as Bhagania Raja, right? Or Bhaga Raja. However, the Kos army soon returned after a peace treaty, right? So there is another Ahom king who is known as Bhagwaniya Raja. He was Joydha Singha. And Sukhangfa, he was also known as Bhagwaniya Raja or Bhaga Raja. And he is also known as Khura Raja, right? Then Sukhangfa actually also had engaged in war with the Nora Raja. And he also defeated the revolt by the Vuya rulers and Aitonian Nogas. And several earthquakes and epidemics occurred during the reign of Sukhangfa and he finally died in the year 1603 AD after a long reign of 50 years. Right? Now let us discuss the period of Ahom Mughal conflict. So the history of Ahoms particularly in the 17th century it was mainly about the Ahom Mughal conflict. And this conflict occurred between the governor of Bengal uh, under Mughal Empire and Ahom King, right? And the Mughal Emperor at that time was Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, right? So in 17th century, the Mughal Emperor were Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. And during that time, there were frequent Ahom Mughal conflicts. So I'll discuss all such conflicts one by one. So why such conflict occurred? The imperial ambition of the Mughal emperors to extend their dominions up to further east beyond Bengal and also to find a route up to China and Tibet actually initiated this kind of Ahom Mughal conflict, right? So after Sukhangfa, Susenfa allies Pratap Hingo ascended the throne of Ahom kingdom in the year 1603 AD. And he got the name Pratap due to his great deeds and exemplary bravery in wars, right? So due to his great wisdom, he was also called as Buddhi Sargon Narayan, very important. And he was also nicknamed as Burharaja because he became king at a very old age. So in the year 1606 AD, Pratap Hingo engaged in a war with the Kosari king Jok Narayan. But after seeing that Mughals are approaching towards Assam, particularly the Ahom kingdom from the western part, the Ahom king Susenfa or Pratap Hingo made a peace treaty with the Kosari kingdom, right? Then in the year 1608 AD, Pratap Hingo married Mongola Dohi or Mogola Dohi. He was the daughter of coast ruler Porikhit. And Porikhit was the son of Raghudev, and Raghudev was the son of Silarai, right? So this is a very important information. Pratap Hingo married a coach daughter, Mogola Dohi. Then in the year 1615, Bolinarayan was defeated by the Mughals. Then he fled to Aham Kingdom, and Pratap Hingo actually cordially received him and provided him shelter. And later, uh, Pratap Hingo established him as a Dorongi Raja. I have discussed this in the lecture on Coast Kingdom. Then the Mughal claim on the coast territory to the east of Bornodi and the trading adventures of the Mughal merchants again initiated the Ahom Mughal conflict during the reign of Pratap Hingo. So in 1616, a Muslim trader was killed 
in Koliabur on suspicion of being a spy, right? So following that event, following that unfortunate event, Sheikh Qasim, so he was the governor of Bengal. So when the you know merchant was killed, governor of Bengal Sheikh Qasim sent an expedition to Ahom Kingdom, and that expedition was led by Soyod Hakim and Soyod Abu Bakr and Satrajit. And the Ahom army resisted the Mughal army in Voroli, but they got defeated. Then after uh, that particular defeat, Ahom army again made a surprise night attack on the Mughal army, both on land and water, and defeated them. And many commanders and soldiers were killed. And at this victory, Pratap Hingap performed the Rikwan ceremony. So, Syed Hakim, Syed Abu Bakr, and Satrajit all were defeated by Pratap Hingha. And a vivid description of the plight of Mughal soldiers in this particular battle is given in the Baharistan e Ghayali that was composed by Mirja Nathan. He was a Mughal general. Very important. Baharistan e Ghayali by Mirja Nathan. Please remember it. Right? Then it was followed by a series of campaigns against the Mughals. So in the year 1618 AD, there was another series of uh, actually battles that took place in Haju. And in that battle of Haju, the Ahoms lost nearby 4,000 boats and equal number of men. And many of them were killed. Then the Ahom soldier retreated. And at that time, Langi Panikya was the Barfukan, right? So Langi Panikya has been able to restore, restore uh, the order among the fugitive Ahom soldiers. And finally, Pratap Hingo awarded or rewarded Langi Panikya by offering him a newly created post called Barfukan. A very important information. So Langi Panikya was the first Barfukan and this particular post was created during the reign of Pratap Hingo. And Barfukan was placed in charge of Lower Assam to the west of Koliabar and he was also the head of diplomatic relation to the west, right? So Barfukan was basically, it is a title. Then Pratap Hingo also created another important post called Barborwa. So he was placed as the head of the secretariat and also head of judiciary and he was immediately under the king. And Mumai Tamuli was the first Barborwa of Ahom Kingdom. And who was Mumai Tamuli? Mumai Tamuli was the father of famous Assamese warrior Lasit Barfukan. Right? Then the conflict of Ahom Mughal, however, didn't stop and it continued with occasional outbursts. Then in the year 1619, Pratap Hingo defeated the Mughal army on the south bank of Brahmaputra. And following this, a number of frontier chiefs of Dimorwa, Luki, Beltala, they actually made submission to Pratap Hingo, right? So here you can see actually the history of Ahom Kingdom is basically a history of fall and rise and victory and defeat, right? Then following that, Pratap Hingo made an alliance with the frontier chiefs and defeated Mughals at Pandu, Horai Ghat and Agiyathuri. So Pandu, Horai Ghat, these are located on the south bank and Agiyathuri is located on the north bank of river Brahmaputra. And as per chronicles of Buranji, a Firangi or European aiding Mughals were captured by the Ahom soldiers. Right? Then ultimately a peace was, peace treaty was basically concluded and peace was restored by Mumai Tamuli Barborwa and Allah Khan in the year 1639 AD. And by that particular treaty, Bornodi on the north and Ohurar Ali on the south uh, were fixed as the boundary between Ahoms and Mughal territories. And that particular treaty was very famous known as Ohurar Ali Treaty. Right. So here you can see the Ohurar Ali Treaty was concluded during the reign of Pratap Hingo and basically it was signed by Mumai Tamuli Barborwa and Allah Yar Khan in 1639. Very important. Now Pratap Hingo introduced the pike system in Ahom Kingdom. So it is the main backbone of Ahom Kingdom, the pike system. I'll discuss pike system in a separate lecture. So some other notable works of Pratap Hingo included construction of several important roads, bridges, excavation of uh, tanks, then ramparts, etc. And he also erected several forts and several towns and also several markets were built. And he appointed Hindu Kotokis or peons. 
Then Pratavhinga died in 1641 AD and he was succeeded by Suramofa. And Suramofa ruled from 1641 up to 1644 and he was followed by Sutiamfa from 44 to 48. And Sutiamfa was known as Noria Raja or Sikh Raja because of his indifferent health. Right. That means he actually often fell ill and hence he was known as Noria Raja or Sikh Raja. Reign of Zoradar Hingha. So let us begin Reign of Joydha Singha. So Noria Raja was succeeded by the Reign of Sutamla. And Sutamla ascended the throne in 1648 AD and he took the name Joydha Singha. Right. So Joydha Singha was the Hindu name and Sutamla was the Thai name, right? And soon after his accession, several conspiracies were made against Joydha Singha. But all those conspiracies were repressed and the conspirators were put to death, right? Then in the year 1650 AD, Joydha Singha sent expedition to control the Lakmanagas. And this particular Incidents followed a series of conflict and eventually after few years the Naga chief made submission to Joydha Singha, right? So during the initial years of Joydha Singha, he had to face the raids of Lakmanagas, right? Then in the year 1655 AD, Miris, they killed two Ahom subjects. Miri were basically the missing people, right? So after that, Joydha Singha sent an expedition to control the Miris and finally they were defeated and the Miris agreed to pay annual tribute to Joydha Singha. Then in the year 1658 AD, Jayantya King Pramottarai attacked the tributary chief of Gobha and he fled. Then Joydha Singha re-established the chief of Gobha, right? Then in the same year, that means in the year 1658 AD, Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan fell sick and taking opportunity of that situation, coast ruler Pran Narayan threw off the Mughal elegance. And taking the same opportunity, Joydha Singha also occupied Gohati. Right? Then Pran Narayan proposed to make an alliance with Ahoms against the Mughals. But Joydha Singha rejected the proposal and in fact he defeated Pran Naran as well and drove the Khos army across the Hunkuk river. Right. So uh, by the year actually 1658, Shah Jahan died. Alright. And Aurangajeb became the Mughal emperor. Then after a few years as a retaliatory action, Mir Jumla. Mir Jumla was the newly appointed Nawab of Bengal. Right. So he was Nabab of Bengal under Emperor Aurangzeb. So Mir Jumla led a huge force to invade Ahom Kingdom in 1662 AD. So this is a very important information. So the invasion of Mir Jumla took place during the reign of Joydha Singha and at that time the Mughal Emperor was Aurangzeb. Very important information. And Mir Jumla was accompanied by Rashid Khan. And the army of Mir Jumla was a very huge army. It comprised of 12,000 horses, 30,000 foot soldiers and also supported by strong navy. And the navy was mostly manned by Europeans, chiefly Portuguese and Dutch. So by that time, by the year 1662, the Portuguese and Dutch have arrived in India, right, for trade purpose, trade and commerce. And they had al already made friendship with Mughal Emperor. And that is why the army of Mir Jumla consisted of Portuguese and Dutch Navy soldiers. Then at first Mir Jumla and his army overrun the defenses put up by Ahom army at Hati Hola, Baritola and Jugi Gufa Fort. Right? And finally they occupied Guwahati. After occupying Guwahati, the Mughal army occupied the fort at Simla Gor and Samdhara. Then the Mughal army had reached Koliabor. Koliabor is located in present day Nogaon district on the bank of Brahmaputra. So Mughal army had a naval victory at Koliabor. Then the Mughal army started advancing towards Ahom capital. So 
Joydo Singh actually he actually uh, got terrified and finally he evacuated the capital of Gorgao with his family members and close associates and he fled to Namrup and Namrup was very close to Patkai Hills right and since he fled or evacuated his capital he was nicknamed as Bhagwaniya Raja in the previous lecture we have discussed the Suramafa. Suramafa was known as Bhagaraja and Joydha Singha known as Bhagoniaraja. So please don't get confused in between two, right? Then the Mirjumla, he occupied Gorgaon, the capital of Ahom Kingdom on March 17, 1662. And he also established some outposts at several places in Upper Assam, mainly in Ahom Kingdom. And he made his headquarters at Mathurapur, right? So although he occupied Gorgaon, he didn't establish his headquarters at Gorgaon, so he made it his headquarters at Mothurapur, right? But soon after that, the rainy season in Assam has started, and those outposts set up by Mir Jumla had been cut off by flood and they became isolated. So the Ahom army they took the advantage and they started harassing the Mughal army by guerrilla warfare method. Then also, Joydha Singha returned from Namrup. Right. So the Mughal army, they felt helpless. They was placed under great hardship, mainly due to the rainy season in Assam. And finally, they agreed to make a peace treaty proposed by the Ahom side. Right. So on 1663, on this day, January 9, the Treaty of Giladhari Ghat was drawn up between the Ahoms and the Mughals. So by that Treaty of Giladhari Ghat, Joydha Singha became a tributary of Mughal, tributary king of Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb, and he also agreed to pay a huge compensation. That compensation consisted of several thousand tolas of gold, silver, and a large number of elephants. Right, and these are actually terms and condition of that particular Treaty of Giladhari Ghat, the cessation of all territory to the west of Voroli on the north bank and Kolong River on the south bank of Brahmaputra. Then Joydha Singha's daughter and the daughter of Tipam Raja was also sent to Delhi, right? And the sons of the ministers were also sent as a hostess with the Mughal till the full compensation payment was made and all the Mughal prisoners to be given up. So these were the conditions of the Treaty of Giladhari Ghat. And very important, it was signed in 1663 between Joydha Singha and Mirjumla, right? Then soon after the treaty, Mirjumla and his army initiated the return journey. But during his return journey, Mirjumla passed away on 30 March 1663. And regarding the invasion of Mirjumla, Mirjumla was the first Mughal commander to occupy Ahom capital, right? And he was successful right here we have discussed and Mirjumla was accompanied by a news reporter his name was Sihabuddin Talis and he authored the book Fatiha I Ibriya very important this question is most commonly asked who wrote the book Fatiha I Ibriya then the answer will be Sihabuddin Talis and Sihabuddin Talis accompanied Mirjumla to Assam and in the Fatiha I Ibriya a valuable account of Assam particularly during Ahom rule its climate its population customs products and the capital of Gorgaon was found right so a valuable information is found regarding Ahom kingdom in Fatiha I Ibriya please remember the name then here i am providing an one excerpt from the Fatiha I Ibriya so Fatiha I Ibriya says that the common people of Assam bury their dead body with some of the property of the diseased, placing the head towards east and the feet towards the west. So here you can see a vivid description regarding the customs and rituals and other information regarding Ahom kingdom can be found, right? Then after Mir Jumla's return, Joydha Singha returned to Bakotha because Gorgaon was despoiled by the Mughal army, right? And Joydha Singha was the first Ahom king to embrace Hinduism by receiving initiation, initiation from a Vaishnava priest, right? And he donated large amount of revenue-free lands along with several pikes to several Vaishnava Hatras. Very important information, right? And one of the notable achievements of Joydha Singha's reign was the 
planned settlement of villages in certain tract of the Ahom kingdom. And Joyda Singha finally passed away in the year 1663. Right. Then let us discuss the reign of Sakrada Singha. So in the year 1663 AD Mirjumna left Ahom capital. And in the same year, Joydha Singha has also passed away. Then he was succeeded by Sakradha Singha. And his Ahom name was Supongmung, right? Soon after Sakradha Singha's accession uh, actually to the Ahom throne, two Mughal officials visited with a reminder that the balance of the war compensation should be paid immediately. And they also presented him a gown called Sirupa sent by Mughal court and asked, uh, asked Sakrada Singha to wear that particular gown. But Sakrada Singha was a person of indomitable courage. Right? He had self-respect and that is why he refused to wear the gown sent by Mughal court. Right? This particular incident is very famous in the history of Ahoms. Right? Then in the year 1665 AD, two expeditions were sent against Bansang Nagas and Miris by Sakrada Singha. Then in 1667 AD, Mughal administrator of Guwahati, Sayyid Firoz Khan, he sent a strong worded letter to Sakrada Singha and he demanded the outstanding indemnity or war compensation. Then after receiving the letter, actually Sakrada Singha felt humiliated and finally he decided to fight against the Mughals. But many nobles actually or officers like Bor Guhai, Burha Guhai, they suggested Sakrada Singha not to engage in a fight with the Mughals. But Sakrada Singha rejected their suggestion and finally preparation for war was completed. And the command for that particular war was entrusted to great warrior Lasit Borfukon. And Lasit Borfukon was the son of Mumai Tamuli Borborwa, right? Then the Ahom army led by Lasit Borfukon along with other generals including Aton Burha Guhai, they first occupied the Mughal outpost at Kazoli and Bahbari, right? And they actually captured prisoners, prisoners means Mughal army, horses, cannons, and all those were sent back to Gorgaon, right? Then soon, Guwahati and Pandu was also captured by Ahom army. And Guwahati was made the headquarters of Borfukon. And Pandu and Horai Ghat were strongly fortified. And an inscription in Assamese on the Kanai Borohibwa was recorded about this particular victory. Right? And a cannon in Silghat also bears this particular inscription about the victory of Ahoms. Right? Then the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb dispersed a Rasput general Ram Hingha this time. So earlier he sent Mejumla and this time he dispersed Rasput general Ram Hingha with a large force in order to invade the Ahom kingdom. Right. Following this Ahoms erected some more fortification. And it is believed that during the negligence in erecting a fort on the bank of river Brahmaputra, Lasit Borfukon even beheaded his uncle by saying that Dekhot Koi Mumai Dangor Nohoi. So it was a very important event in the history of Ahoms, right? So Lasit Borfukon beheaded his uncle because of his negligence in erecting a fort during the invasion of Ramhingha, right? Then in the first engagement in Tejpur, the Ahoms got defeated. But later, in a naval war, the Ahoms defeated the Mughals and the Mughals army finally retreated or fled to Haju, right? Then at this point, Ram Hingha invited Sakrada Singha for a single combat. But he declined and ordered Lasit Borfukon for a renewed attack. But at that particular battle, the Ahoms had a heavy loss. And this particular war dragged on for several years with loss on both sides, right? Therefore, Ramhingo offered a peace treaty and the hostilities were suspended for a short time. Then in the year 1670, Sakrada Singha passed away and he was succeeded by his brother Udairitta Hingha and his home name was Sunyatfa, right? But the conflict between Ahoms and 
Mughals, it continued, right? I will discuss it in the next slide. So here comes the Battle of Horaigat, the famous Battle of Horaigat. So the negotiation between Ahom and Mughal sides continued, but Ram Hingha got reinforcement of several thousand troops and the war then got renewed. The Ahoms also advanced with around 20,000 troops from Samdhora Fort to Horaigat Fort. And in the year 1671, Ahoms and Mughals army, they engaged in a two-front war at Horaigat. Two-front war means both at land and both in the river. Naval war and land war. And the Ahom army successfully defeated the Mughals on land. But in the naval war, Ahom army got defeated by the Mughals and they started retreating to Borkhila. And when actually Lasit Borfukon came to know about this situation, at actually at that time, he was very sick, but despite of his sickness, he arrived at the battlefield with more slips or small vessels and seeing Lasit Borfukon, the Ahom army acquired a new jail and finally they were able to defeat the Mughal army. So this is the famous battle of Horaigat, right? Uh, then facing a disastrous defeat at Horaigat, Ram Hingha retreated to Rongamati in March 1671, right? Then the Hadira Soki opposite to Gwalpara became the new frontier outpost of Ahoms. And in this particular battle of Horaigat, the Garos and the king of Ranis and other tribal chiefs, they assisted the Ahoms. And many other neighboring hill states also sent their contingent of armies, right? Then the battle of Horaigat, it has a great significance in the history of medieval India and also in Assam because the great Mughal power at that time Mughal was a great power of India right so in the battle of Horaigat the Mughal had to face a disastrous defeat right and that is why battle of Horaigat has a great significance in the history of India as well and Alasid Borfukon died about a year after the victory of Horaigat right then after the battle of Horaigat, Udayaditya Hingha sent an expedition to Dafala state. And soon after that, Udayaditya Hingha met a Vaishnav reformer and got impressed and finally he gave him a huge land grant and made him a spiritual preceptor. And he also ordered his nobles to follow this Vaishnav reformer and many nobles got offended by this particular initiative taken by Udayaditya Hingha. And that is why several conspiracies were made against him. And finally, Udaritya Hingo was poisoned to death on August 1673. Right. So mainly by nobles. Then regarding Lasit Borfukon, Lasit Borfukon was a great patriot. Right. And he was a great warrior. And his devotion to his land is best reflected in the famous Battle of Horaigat. So during the preparation for the Battle of Horaigat, he ordered a fortification to be constructed within one night. And he employed his maternal uncle as the supervisor of that particular task. Then when late night Lasit came for inspection, he found that the work was not progressing satisfactorily. And seeing the negligence of duty, Lasit became furious. And finally, he beheaded his maternal uncle on the spot, saying that my uncle is not greater than my nation. And that is why the remains of this particular fortification is still known as Mumai Kota Gor. Then great warrior Lasit Borfukon, however, defeated by illness. And he was passed away soon after the victory of Battle of Horaigat. And his remains were buried in the Lasit Moidam that was constructed in 1672 by Udaritya Hingha at Holongapar near Jurhat. And on 24th of November each year, Lasit Dibok is celebrated in Assam as a state holiday mainly to commemorate the heroism of Lasit Borfukon. So Lasit Dibok is celebrated or observed on 24th of November. Now let us discuss the period of unstable Ahom Kingdom. So after Udayaditya Hingha, the nobles chose Ramdas Hingha to the throne and he died in 1675 AD. Then Ramdas Hingha was followed by Suhung, Gubar, Suzinfa and Sudoifa. Sudoifa was known as Parbatya Kumar. 
And this particular period from 1675 to 79, it was a period of weak and unstable Ahom Kingdom. And during that period, several weak and young kings were placed on the Ahom throne and then quickly removed by the ministers and other higher officials for their own selfish gains. Right. So by taking advantage of such situation, weak Ahom Kingdom, Laluk Hula Borfukon handed over Guwahati to the Mughals. And many Ahom high officials were dissatisfied with the Sudoifa and they actually allied with Lalok Hula Borfukon, right? Then in 1679, Sudoifa was killed and Sulikfa was chosen to the throne. Then uh, Sulikfa was nicknamed as Glora Raza because he actually became king at a very tender age. And here we can remember Pratap Hingha. Pratap Hingha became king at a very old age, right? And that is why he was known as Burha Raza. And here Sulikfa was nicknamed as Lora Raja. And this type of information are very, very important from examination point of view, right? So Sulikfa, Lora Raja, please try to remember. Then soon after that, actually, Lalokula Borbukon became very greedy and ambitious. And he started misusing his power in every affairs of the Ahom Kingdom. He, in fact, instigated Sulikfa to provide death penalty to several Ahom Kumas from 1679 to 1681. And at that time, Godapani Kumar from Tungkungya Foyd, he was the most capable prince to take over as a Ahom King. So when he saw that actually Lalokhula, Borfukon and Sulikfa, they were providing death penalty to the Ahom Kumars, Godapani fled from Ahom Kingdom and he sought shelter at Boisnab Hotras and also in the adjoining hills outside Ahom Kingdom. Right? Then when the actually soldiers of Sulikfa, they failed to trace Prince Godapani, they brought his wife Zoymoti to Jeranga Pothar. And despite horrific torture, Zoymoti Kuri refused to reveal the whereabouts or address of her husband Godapani. So therefore, after continuous physical torture over 14 days, Zoymoti died on 27 March 1680 AD. So here we can see the sacrifice of Joy Moti for her husband and for the sake of Ahom Kingdom. And Joy Moti was accorded the honorific Hoti title due to her supreme sacrifice for the husband and Ahom Kingdom, right? And that is why he is known as uh, she is known as Hoti, right? Then when the Sulikfa soldiers they failed to trace Prince Godapani or Godapani Kumar, they brought his wife Joy Moti Kuri to Jeranga Pothar, right? And in jo Jeranga Pothar, Joy Moti Kuri was tortured. She was asked to reveal the whereabouts of her husband, but she refused. And finally, after continuous physical torture over 14 days, Joy Moti Kuri died on 27 of March 1680 AD. So very important information. She died on 27 of March 1680 AD. And Joymoti was accorded the honorific Hoti title due to her supreme sacrifice for the sake of her husband and for the better future of Ahom Kingdom. And soon after the death of Joymoti, Lalokhula Borfukon was assassinated by the uh, bodyguards Bhutai Deka, Madhav Tamuli and Aguna Kosari. And Sulikfa was also killed, right? Then comes the reign of Godador Hingha. So after Sulikfa, Godapani was formally chosen by nobles to the Ahom throne in August 1681 AD. And Godadhar Hingha assumed the Thai name Supatafa and Hindu name Godadhar Hingha, right? And Godadhar Hingha restored the authority of Ahom king and he brought peace and order to Ahom kingdom, right? As I have already mentioned, uh, prior to Godadhar Hingha, there was a weak and unstable Ahom Kingdom. But Godadar Hingha restored the order in Ahom Kingdom, right? Then Godadar Hingha sent a huge Ahom forces to reoccupy Guwahati. And the Ahom army first occupied the forts at Bonghibari and Kajoli. And the Ahoms actually engaged in full front war with the Mughals led by Mansur Khan at Itakhuli. Very important information. During the reign of Godador Hingha, the Battle of Itakhuli took place 
between Ahom Mughal and Itakul is near Guwahati, right? Then in that particular battle, the Mughal army were defeated. Then the defeated Mughal forced the Mansur Khan fled and Ahoms occupied Guwahati. And this particular battle of Itakuli of 1682, it is the last battle between Ahoms and Mughal. Very important information. Please remember it, right? Then Godadar Hinga repressed several conspiracies against him. And he also sent expedition against Miris and Nagas. And during that time, during the reign of Godadar Hinga, Ekhoran Bhagavadi Dharma or Neo Vaishnavite faith propagated by Srimanta Hankardev and also the Vaishnav Khatras, they have attained remarkable influence all over the Ahom Kingdom. And the country became full of Vaishnav followers, right? And at that time, actually, the Vaishnav followers were exempted from the Pike system. And that is why many people became followers of Khatras only to get exemption from the Pike system. So basically, there were disorder at that time, right? And apart from that, Godadar Hingo had also developed some personal grudge against some Guhai or Hotra uh, because they refused to give him shelter during his exile, right? So finally, Godadar Hingo decided to break the power of Hotras and Guhais and he ordered his soldiers and many Guhai were captured and killed and their properties were also confiscated. And the disciples and the followers of Hotras were captured and robbed of their property and they were forcefully engaged in different type of works. So by engaging the idle followers of the Hotras, a long road on the south bank of Brahmaputra was built during the reign of Gadadar Hinga and that was the famous Thudar Ali, right? So the idol followers of Khatras were termed as Dhod, right? And the Dhudorali is basically a 212 km long road starting from Komargao in Gulaghat up to Joypur in Dibrugar. And it passes through Morion in Jurhat. And now this particular Dhudorali, it is a state highway, right? And Godadar Hingo also initiated a detailed land survey of Ahom Kingdom for the first time. And Godadar Hingo also built a Shiba temple at Umanondo Island in Guwahati. And the other notable public works of Godadar Hingo are Oka Ali, then two stone bridges, and also several tanks, right? And he was a Hakta follower. And Godadar Hingo finally passed away in 1696 AD. Now let us some information about Joymoti. So in memory of Joymoti, her son Rudra Hingo built the Joyhagar tank and Joyhagar Joydol at Hibohagar. And Hoti Joymoti Dibok is commemorated every year on 27th of March to actually remember the sacrifice of Hoti Joymoti. And government of Assam has also instituted an annual award in the name of Joymoti and it is presented to women in recognition of excellence in their chosen fields of works. And the first Assamese movie, Joymoti, directed by Juti Prakat Agarola in 1935, it is also based on Joymoti, right? So guys, this is all about regarding the second part of Ahom Kingdom. Reign of Rudrahinga. So after the death of Godadar Hingha, actually he had two sons, Lai and Lesai. So after his death, his elder son Lai assumed the name Sukhrangfa and he assumed the Hindu name Rudra Hingha. So basically Rudra Hingha was the son of Godadar Hingha and Hoti Jaimati, right? So Rudra Hingha actually inherited a strong and peaceful kingdom from his father Godadar Hingha. So in my previous lecture, I have already discussed that how Godadar Hingha brought order to Ahom Kingdom, right? Then the first engagement during Rudra Hingha's reign was with Kosari King. So during his reign actually Kosari King Tamradhas declared independence. So Rudra Hingha dispersed Borborua and Pani Fukon with a huge Ahom force. And the Ahom forces basically occupied the Kosari capital at Maibong. So here we can see that Suhung Mung had occupied Right, Suhung Mung had occupied the first Kosari capital, Timapur, and here we can see Rudra Hingo had occupied the second Kosari capital at Maibong. Right, and after that, uh, actually, they fled to Kaspur, the Kosaris. So, anyway, since the Ahom army occupied the 
कसरी कैपिटल माइबंग दे वेर रिकल इन दर सेवेन्टीन सेवेन ए डि राइट देन ड्यूरींग दिस पार्टिकुलर एटेक एक्चुअलि कसारी किंग तमरदास फ्लेट एंड हि वज हेल्ड कैप्टिव बै जयंतिया किंग राम सिंह राइट एंड इन देक्चर अन जयंतिया किंगडम आई हेव डिस्कस्ड और टोल्ड यू देट राम सिंह वज ए भेरी फेमास जयंतिया किंग सो वेन राम सिंह एक्चुअलि हेल्ड कैप्टिव तमरधस रुद्र सिंह डायरेक्टेड हिम टू रिलीज तमरधस बट राम सिंह रिफ्यूज टू डू शो सो Following that, Rudra Singha sent another expedition. This time to Jayantia Kingdom. Right? Then, Ahom soldiers they captured both Tamradhas and Ram Singha. They were captured and they were brought to Ahom Kingdom. Right? And Rudra Singha then received both of them in a grand darbar that was held or organized in Biswanat on the bank of River Bhamaputra. and this particular darbar and or this particular incident it is also mentioned in the class 10 textbook of seba right so anyway uh, following that particular event rudra singha announced the annexation of both kasari kingdom and jayantia kingdom into ahom territory right so here you can see rudra singha occupied kasari and jayantia kingdom but the conflict between ahoms and jayantia continued for several years Then Rudra Singha also planned to invade Bengal with the support from the rulers and chiefs of the neighboring states like Tripura, Kosh Bihar, Burdwan and Nodia. And in fact all the preparation were also completed. And Rudra Singha himself advanced in person to Guwahati. He organized actually a huge force. He organized a number of soldiers, numerous fleet, basically the boats, right? And also cannons. And at that time cannons were also known as Bore tube or tube, right? But unfortunately, Rudra Singha fell ill, and he passed away in Guwahati in 1714 A.D. So here you can see, although Rudra Singha planned to invade Bengal, his plan remained incomplete or not fulfilled. And Rudra Singha is considered to be the greatest of all Ahom kings. So let us have a look of the brief account of the kingdom of Rudra Singha, right? So Rudra Singha had a reign of seventeen eventful years. He ruled for seventeen years, right? So as I have already discussed, that his father, Gorador Singha, he had a strict policy towards the Boisna of Hatras and Gukhai. So he killed many Gukhai and also confiscated the properties of Boisna of Hatras. But Rudra Singha reversed that policy, right? So he reversed the policy and he allowed to resume the old position of the Hatras and Gukhais. in the ahom kingdom but he made one condition that mazuli would be the headquarters of the bosnap culture or bosnap khatras and accordingly mazuli became the chief seat of bosnap khatras since the reign of rudra singha so here you can see the correlation between the culture of assam and the history of assam right then rudra singha also imported an artisan named khanasyam from bengal and actually at that time there were not many skilled workers in the ahom kingdom and that is why several artisans were imported from bengal and that is why ghanasyam was also imported and under the supervision of ghanasyam a capital city was constructed in rangpur rangpur is present day sipsaga city and also several brick palaces were built right then during the reign of gurudra singha joydol and joyhagar tank was built why it was built in memory of his mother joy moti right then rudra singha also built rangona dol fakwa dol and all these are located very near to the rangpur region then rudra singha had also built a ranghar using bamboo thatch cane etc right uh, but that it got actually destroyed and after rudra singha pramatta singha had erected another masonry ranghar and the present rangar which is located in sipsagar that was constructed by pramatta singha but if question comes that who constructed the first rangar then the answer will be rudra singha but if someone ask you that who constructed rangar then the answer will be obviously pramatta singha right so masonry rangar by pramatta singha and bamboo and cane rangar by rudra singha so please don't get confused very important fact 
Then during his reign, masonry bridges over Namdang and Dimo River was constructed. Very important information. Namdang or Hilor Hako. It is a very important architectural you know, wonder of Ahom period. And even it will it is existent it it, uh, it present, right? So regarding the notable works of Rudrahinga, he built the Joy Dol and Joy Hagar in memory of his mother, Joy Moti. Then he had also built Rangonath Dol and Fakwa Dol. Then the most important one is the a Ronghar was built using bamboo thatch canvas built during the reign of Rudrahinga. So if question comes that who built the first Ronghar in Ahom Kingdom, then the answer will be Rudrahinga. But that particular bamboo Ronghar got destroyed, and after that, Pramatta Hinga had another masonry Ronghar, which is present now, right? So the present Ronghar is uh, constructed by Pramatta Hinga. Then, during the reign of Rudrahinga, masonry bridges over Namdang and Dimo River was constructed. Right, so it is known as Nam Dangor Hilor Hako, very important, and it is still present. And the present NH 37 also passes over this particular masonry bridges or stone bridge over Nam Dang River. Right, and he also built roads like Meteka Ali, Khorikoti Ali, etc. Right, and a land survey was initiated by his father Godadar Hinga, and it was completed by Rudra Hinga. Right. So these are some notable public works of Rudrahinga. And Rudrahinga is also known for his liberal policy and in fact he allowed to grow trade with Bengal and other states as well. And he also imported several customs like dress songs from other states, mainly North India like Gorda, then Bengal, Orissa, etc. Right? And he created the post of Bezborwa for practicing traditional medicine. So whenever we you know, talk about Besborwa, the first name comes to our mind is Lokminat Besborwa, right? And Lokminat Besborwa was a literary stalwart of Assamese literature. But his father, Dinonat Besborwa, he was a practitioner of traditional medicine. Very important. Besborwa practiced traditional medicine in a home kingdom, right? And basically, it is a title or post. Then uh, earlier actually along with the dead king, servants were also buried in the moidams. But Rudrahinga put an end to this inhuman custom. And Rudrahinga also patronized games, sports, culture and literature. Right? And he also created the post of Gayan Borwa and Kukuraswa Borwa. So why he created this post? He created this post to look after music, dance and sports respectively. So, Gayan Borwa for music dance and Kukuraswa Borwa for sports and different kind of sports were there at that time. Say for example, animal fight, different kind of animal fight like buffalo fight, elephant fight, etc. Right? So, he was a great lover of sport and culture, Rudra Hingha. Then Rudra Hingha celebrated the Bihu festival in his royal palace. And there was a very important event that took place during his reign. In 1694, Rudrahinga invited young Bihu dancers to perform Bihu in the field which is in, in front of Ranghar. Very important information. If someone asks you which Ahom king invited Bihu dancers to perform Bihu in Ranghar, answer will be Rudrahinga. Right? And he was also fond of watching animal fight and that is why he had built a Ronghar using bamboo and can. Then regarding literature, Rudrahinga also patronized several scholars and authors. Kobira Sakraborty was the royal poet of his court. And he also formally decided to embrace Hinduism and invited Krishnaram Bhattasajja of Bengal. Right? To actually mainly to embrace Hinduism. But he later changed his mind and he didn't embrace Hinduism. But prior to his death, he directed or ordered five of his sons to become disciples of Krishnaram Bhattasajja. Krishnaram Bhattasajja is basically a priest or Brahmin from Bengal, right? Uh, then uh, Chai Rudrahinga had five sons, Hiba Hinga, Pramatta Hinga, Rajasra Hinga, Lakhmi Hinga and Barjana Guhai, right? And he made a very interesting rule or custom. So prior to his death, Rudrahinga directed his sons to ascend the Ahom throne one after another. So first Hibohinga, then instead of Hibohinga's son, it was succeeded by Pramatta Hinga. Then instead of Pramatta Hinga's son, 
he was succeeded by Rajaswara Hinga followed by Lakshmi Hinga, right? So there was a unusual tradition or custom practice uh, during the reign of these four kings, right? And then Rudra Hinga died in 1714 and he was succeeded by Shiva Hinga and his name was Sutanfa. So let us discuss the reign of Shiva Hinga now. So as directed by his father, Shiva Hinga became the disciple of Krishna Bhattacharya and he also gave him the management of Kamaikha temple that is located in Ninachal hill. And since uh, Krishna Bhattacharya and his successors lived in Nilachal hill, they were known as Parvatiya Gukhai. Parvat means hill, isn't it? So hence the name Parvatiya Gukhai, right? Uh, then uh, during Shiva Hinga's reign, there was actually unprecedented growth of Hindu religion and Hibo Hingo was completely under the influence of Hindu priest and astrologer. And in the year 1722 AD, Hibo Hingo was alarmed by the astrology prediction of Hindu priest and astrologer. So they predicted that the Hibo Hingo's rule will soon come to an end. So to avert that particular situation, Hibo Hingo declared Chief Queen Fuleshwari as the Bar Raza, right, or the Queen, and he handed over the royal Ahom power to Bar Raza Fuleshwari, right. But Fuleshwari was also under the influence of Hindu Brahmins. She even insulted the Brahmin or sorry, Vaishnav Mahantas by forcing them to bow down to the goddess Durga. So usually, Vaishnav Mahantas they do not worship idols or Hindu god, god and goddesses, right. So, because they believe in one faith, Ekharan Bhagavati Dharma, right? But uh, Hibohinga's uh, wife, Queen Fuleshwari, she forced Vaishnav Mahantas to bow down to Goddess Durga. And she also ordered to establish Protima or idols in Vaishnav Khatras, right? And all these were against the principle of Vaishnav faith, right? So, basically, she forced the Vaishnav Mahantas to break their belief right so he uh, see hearted their sentiment and belief then fuller story died in 1731 then after that Hiba Hinga married her sister Draupadi and made her Boraza with the name Queen Ambika then Queen Ambika died in 1741 then after that Hiba Hinga married Queen Harvest story so here you can see Hiba Hinga had three wives or three queens First Fuleshwari, then Queen Ambika, then finally Queen Harveshwari, right? And regarding public works, uh, in Hingboyinga's reign, Thai Ali was built. And since he was under the influence of Hindu gym, a number of Hindu temples were also built and reconstructed by Hingboyinga. Then a survey was also initiated by Hingboyinga in Kamrup and Bokota region, right? And all the survey results were recorded in Para Kagos. Para Kagos means register. Uh, then Boraza Fuleshwari built Gori Hagor Dole and Gori Hagor Tank. Then Boraza Ambika caused the construction of Hibo Dole and Hibo Hagor Tank. Right? Uh, then other notable works or public works are like Boraza Fuleshwari patronize education and learning to a great extent. And in earlier time, the learning centers were known as Hongskrit tool or tool because their medium of instruction were mainly Hongskrit. So Queen Fuleshwari had established several tool or toll. This is the spelling toll for learning, right? Then in the year 1734, Hukumar Borkite authored a famous book on medical treatment and training of elephant, and the name of the book was Hosti Bidarnob. Very important, and this book was authored following the order of Boraza Fuleshwari. Then there were some other notable literary works like Kobira Sakraborty authored Hokundala Kaibo. These were basically poet, right? Then Ananda Sajjo authored Ananda Lahiri. Kobi Sandra Des authored Kam Kumar Haran and Dharma Puran. And they were basically Vaishnav poets, poets, right? Then in the year 1739 AD, four Europeans paid a visit to Hibohinga and finally Hibohinga passed away in 1744 AD, right? Now let us discuss the reign of Pramattahinga. So after the death of Hibohinga, his brother Pramattahinga ascended the throne in 1744. So Pramattahinga was the second son of Rudrahinga, right? And he assumed the name Sunanfa. And he constructed the masonry Ranghar at Rangpur. 
basically it is a royal sports pavilion and you will find it uh, in the sipsagar town at present right uh, then new masonry buildings and gateways were also constructed at gorgaon by pramatta hingha and the hukreshwar temple and rudreshwar temple both are in guwahati these were also erected by pramatta hingha but regarding other engagement or battle his reign was almost peaceful without any major conflict and he died in 751 after a reign of 7 years right sibohinga and pramatta hingha now we will discuss the reign of rajeshwar hingha so after the death of pramatta hingha his brother rajeshwar hingha ascended the throne in 1751 ad so rajeshwar hingha was the third son of rudra hingha right and rajeshwar hingha assumed the ahom name suramfa or suramfa Then in the year 1758, the Dafolas committed several raids in Giladhari Ghat. So Dafola basically it is a hill tribe, and mostly they are found in Arunachal Pradesh state at present. And here you can see that in Ahom Kingdom, in the surrounding tribes like Naga tribe, Dafola tribe, then Singpho tribe, they made constant raids right during that time. and also uh, mikir miri they were inside the uh, ahom kingdom uh, sorry inside assam actually so they also made actually raid in ahom kingdom so anyway when the dafolas com they committed raids rajeshwar hingha erected forts and prohibited the dafolas to enter the plains so the dafolas felt helpless and they made submission to ahom king rajeshwar hingha and an agreement was also made to allow the dafolas to collect taxes from the frontier areas of ahom kingdom and the dafola territory right then in the year 1765 two huge expedition were sent against the mikir because mikir mikir means basically they are the karbi tribe and they are mostly found in the mikir hill region of central assam and one more important point is that although uh you know ahom kingdom was often considered as assam but the point is that ahom kingdom was mainly concentrated in the eastern part of assam and some part like mikir hills was not not included right and also the southern part like maibong khaspur these were part of kosari kingdom right so the entire assam was not under ahom kingdom so mikirs they had a separate territory so they had stopped paying tribute to ahom king rajeshwar hingha so uh, following that actually a huge force was sent and mikis uh, they got afraid and they started paying tribute and also begged forgiveness from rajeshwar hingha so these are basically some event from the reign of rajeshwar hingha right all the, of these are not important but here actually i am covering entire assam history through storytelling See guys, with the help of uh, this particular storytelling, you'll be able to remember the facts in a much better way. By memorizing the fact, right, or by rote learning, it is not possible to cover any history, right? And that is why I am covering it in a storytelling way. So anyway, these are additional information. So in the year 1765 AD, Rajeshwar Hingha summoned Kosari king Khandikari, but Khandikari was a very powerful king, so he refused. Uh, to come to ahom kingdom so rajeshwar hingha sent a huge force under kirti chandra borborwa right then following that kosari king hondikari got afraid and he came to ahom kingdom and paid tribute to rajeshwar hingha but in that particular incident or event uh, that means when hondikari came to ahom kingdom he was also accompanied by another king he was the raja of manipur joy singh and at that time joy singh was taking shelter in the kosari kingdom because his uh, manipur kingdom was invaded and occupied by the burmese army so joy singh actually sought help or assistance from the ahom king rajeshwar hingha to fight against the burmese and rajeshwar hingha also agreed to help him and thus passed a huge ahom force under hornat fukon to manipur right to fight against the burmese and hence comes the famous or popular event called lotakota run 
so it is a very important event in the history of ahoms lota kota run so what is lota kota run basically so here we can see rajeshwar hingo dispatched a force to manipur right so to reach manipur that force actually marched through hills to the south of saraidio so they actually travel through deep jungles or you know dense jungle forest and also through hills and on their way actually they had to find a way by clearing cripplings in assamese cripplings are called a lota so since the soldiers had to find their way by clearing lotas it was known as lota kota run so it is not a, a real fight between two parties right or two uh, forces or two armies so basically the ahom soldiers had to cut the lotas and hence the name lota kota run but it was unsuccessful because in that journey the ahom soldiers faced great hardship many got killed and some were killed by the nagas and finally they were called back by rajeshwar hingo then after that in 1768 ad another force was sent and that force actually included around 10000 troops and this time it was sent under the leadership of kirti sandra borborwa and with the help of that particular force joy singh was able to defeat the burmese army and he was able to reoccupy the throne of manipur right so this is uh, how we can see rajeshwar hingo helped the manipuri king to regain his kingdom so actually joy singh was very happy right he was satisfied and that is why he sent so many presents and valuables to rajeshwar hingo and most importantly he had offered his daughter kurangonoyni in marriage to rajeshwar hingo so here we can see rajeshwar hingo married a manipuri daughter kurangonoyni very important information and there might be a direct question uh, who was kurangonoyni or uh, manipuri king uh, manipuri queen kurangonoyni is married by which ahom king then the answer will be rajeshwar hingo right and a number of manipuri people also came to ahom kingdom along with kurangonoyni and they settled in the disoi river on the bank of disoi river and that particular place was came to known as mongolo hat why mongolo because the ahoms actually called the manipuris as mongolo and hence the name mongolo hat right so very interesting fact isn't it so soon after that rajeshwar hingo fell ill and he died in 1769 ad in a dergaon then a number of manipuri people they came to ahom kingdom with kurangonoyni right and those manipuri people they settled on the bank of disoi river and that particular place was later known as mongolu hat why mongolu because the ahom people called the manipuri as mongolos and soon after that actually rajeshwar hingo fell ill and he passed away in 769 at dergaon right and rajeshwar hingo he was a very able king and he but he preferred pleasure he loved pleasure and he is not at all interested in the government affairs or state affairs and that is why he left by, he left the ahom government in the hands of kirti sandra borborwa so kirti sandra borborwa took advantage of that he became very ambitious but did this particular kind of activity or attitude of kirti sandra borborwa caused a great dissatisfaction or resentment among the nobles like bor guhai burha guhai etc and here i am mentioning a very important incident so at that time actually numoli bor guhai so numoli bor guhai wrote a buronji named sokori feti and in that particular buronji it was mentioned that kirti sandra was from a lower descent so when kirti sandra came to know about this he got offended so what he did he obtained a permission from the ahom king to examine all the buronjis at that time then those buronjis which contained any objectionable information or content all such buronjis were burned so here you can see a huge number of buronjis or chronicles were burned by kirti sandra borborwa in the reign of rajeshwar hingo and regarding this please remember the sokori feti buronji was written by numoli borguhai right then soon after that actually this kind of activity as i have already mentioned this kind of activity of kirti sandra caused dissatisfaction among officials of ahom kingdom right and that is why several assassinations were plotted against kirti sandra borborwa but he survived somehow 
and regarding Rajaswar Hinga, he was a strict Hindu and soon after his accession, he paid a long visit to Guwahati to worship in various temples, right? Then let us discuss some public works of Rajaswar Hinga. So he erected several temples and doles. He erected those in Bosista Sram, Moni Karnasar and Navagraha Devalai. And all these are located in the Guwahati city at present. And Rajaswar Hinga also erected a new dole in Negheri Ting. Then construction of Karenghar and Talatal Ghar were the most notable work of Rajaswar Hinga. Right? Karenghar basically it is the royal palace located in Gorgao. And no need to worry, I will separately discuss the Karenghar, Talatal Ghar and some important monuments about uh, in the home kingdom. But here I am just mentioning that Rajaswar Hinga built the Karenghar. And it was completed in the year 1752, right? And the Talatal Ghar, it is known as Rangpur Palace and it is located in Rangpur, right? So please remember Rajaswar Hinga constructed Karen Ghar and Talatal Ghar. Now let us discuss the reign of Lakshmi Hinga. So Lakshmi Hinga was the fourth son of Rudra Hinga. Anyway, after the death of Rajasthan Hinga, actually, there was a difference of opinion amongst the nobles regarding the successor of Ahom Chon. So, there were two factions. One faction was headed by Kriti Sandra and they was in favor of Lakshmi Hinga. And there was another faction and that faction was in favor of Namrup Raja or, or the, uh, he was the actually eldest son of Rajasthan Hinga, right? But finally, Lakshmi Hinga ascended the throne in 1769 AD. And he assumed the name Sunyatfa. And Lakshmi Hinga, actually, he had a very dark complexion, right? So his skin color was dark and he was nicknamed as Kal Kholiya Guhai, right? And when actually he became king, Lakshmi Hinga's age was around 55 years. So he was not inactive, he was not active. He became old. And that is why he left the state affairs or administration in the hands of Kirti Sandra Barbarwa. And one most important event of Lakshmi Hinga's reign was the revolt of Muamoriyas. Right? And here we will discuss the Muamoriya revolt now onwards. And Muamoriyas were basically the disciples of Mayamura Khatra. And now let us discuss the factors responsible for Muamoriya revolt. Actually, there were several factors behind Muamoriya revolt, right? Or the rise of Muamoriyas. So first of all, the relation between Muamoriyas and Ahom kings started declining in the reign of Pratap Hinga. Then following that, Suramfa and Godadar Hinga, they even provided death penalties to Muamoriya Mahanta, Nityananda Dev and Boykuntha Dev, right? So this kind of activity or attitude of the Ahom kings caused a great resentment among the Muamoriyas, right? Then during Hibohinga's reign, Baraza Fuleshwari tried to impose different type of Hindu Sakta rituals on the Mohantas of Mayamara Khatra. So they got offended. Then after that, Kirti Sandra Barbarwa also provided physical punishment to Nahor, right? So Nahor basically came uh, to make annual offer of elephant to the royal palace. But in the royal palace, Kirti Sandra Barbarwa abused Nahor. So Nahor was offended and since then he was looking for opportunity to take revenge on the Kirti Sandra Barbarwa. So these are actually series of event or factor which actually led to the Muamoria revolt. And this is the turning point. Here I am discussing one day Lakshmi Hinga was traveling along with Kirti Sandra and on their way actually they meet Muamoria Guhai and he showed respect to the king but he didn't offer any respect to Kirti Sandra. Right? So Kirti Sandra got offended and he verbally abused the Muamoria Guhai. Right? And this was the turning point and soon the Muamoriyas decided to fight against the Ahom Kingdom. Uh, then the Guhai of Muamoria Khatra, he appointed his son Bagan to lead the Muamoria rebel. And they were also joined by three exiled Ahom princes. And in the year 1769, the first engagement between Muamoria rebels and Ahom soldiers took place. But in the first engagement, the Muamorias were defeated by Ahom army. But soon, the Muamoria rebels were led by Raghav Soikya. And then they were able to defeat the Ahom soldiers in a number of engagements, in a number of consequent engagements, right? 
Then the Muamoria rebels occupied the capital Rangpur. So very important event in the year 1769, the rise of Muamoria revolt was still and even they were able to occupy the Ahom capital Rangpur. Then Lakshmi Singha was captured and he was held captive in the Joy Hagar Dole and Kirti Sandra Barbarua was killed, right? Then after occupation of Rangpur, Raghav assumed the post of Barbarua and Ramakanta. Ramakanta was the son of Maransif Nahar. So Ramakanta was made the king and coins were also minted in Ramakanta's name in the same year 1769 AD. So this, this is the year 1769 AD in Lakhmina, uh, Lakhmi Kinga's reign, the famous Muamoria revolt took place. Please remember, very important from examination point of view. But the Muamorias, they didn't bring any change to Ahom administration, right? So they retained the entire structure of the Ahom government. And initially, this new Muamoria regime, they didn't face any opposition from the Ahom side. But soon, Ahom nobles and other officials, along with Queen Kuranga Noeni, they planned to overthrow the Muamoria regime. So, who was Queen Kuranga Noeni? She was the widowed wife of Raja Soringa. Raja Soringa had died by that time, right? But Kuranga Noeni was still there, right? So, finally, they took advantage of Bihu festival, the Ahom force. So, actually, in the Bihu festival, the Muamorias got busy. And taking advantage of that situation, Raghav Barbaro was first killed, right? And also a number of Muamoria officers were also killed. But fortunately, Ramakanto, the king Ramakanto was able to escape. Then Lakshmi Kingha was released from captivity and he was reinstated in the throne, right? Uh, then after that, actually, a vigorous persecution of the Muamorias took place. A large number of Muamorias were captured and many of them was killed. Followed, uh, f following the order of Lakshmi Kingha. Then finally, in the year 1780, Lakshmi Kingha died at an age of 68 years, right? So this is the reign of Lakshmi Kingha and Muamoria revolt. Now let us discuss the reign of Gorinath Kingha. So Lakshmi Kingha was succeeded by his son Gorinath Kingha in the year 1780 AD, right? And the actually Ahom Kingdom, it started to decline from the reign of Gorinath Hingha, right? So first of all, after his accession to the Ahom throne, he had to face the Muamoria revolt. So in the year 1782, the Muamoria revolt rose again with a renewed vigor and increased hostilities. And even they advanced to Gorgaon. But the rebels were treated with severity and many of them were executed, right? Uh, and in the same year actually, Purnananda Burhaguhai got the appointment, right? He became Burhaguhai. And Purnananda Burhaguhai, he is a very important and uh, actually very brave personality in the history of Ahoms. He was a very brave officer, far-sighted and efficient Ahom officer. And he advised Gorinath Hingha to adopt liberal policy towards Muamoria's to resolve the issue, to resolve the Ahom Muamoria conflict. And uh, Following the advice of Purnananda Burhaguhai, in the year 1985, Gorinath Hingha allowed Muamoriyas to have a guru. And Pitambor Dev was appointed as the Muamoriya Mohanta at that time. Then after that, there was a brief pause. Right? That means, pause means actually for a few years, there was no you know, conflict between Ahoms and Muamoriyas. But again, the Muamoriya disturbances started but this time in the North Bank. So this time, the Muamoria rebels were led by Harihar Tati. And they defeated the Ahom soldiers in several wars or engagement. And they advanced towards the capital Rangpur. So Gordonat Kingha felt helpless. So he sought assistance from Manipur, Kasari Kingdom, Jayantya Kingdom. And also he assist, actually sought assisted uh, or help from the chiefs of Rani, Beltola, Luki. And this Rani, Beltola, Luki, these are tribal areas, particularly in the Kamrup region, right? And here, the, uh, actually, this location, you can still find Rani, Beltola, etc., right? And But before the help arrived, the Muamoria rebels were able to occupy Rangpur. So when they occupied Rangpur, 
Gorinath Hingho escaped to Guwahati along with his family members. Then at Rongpur, the Muamoriyas set up Bharat Hingho as the king. So the first Muamoriya king was Ramakanto, then the second was the Bharat Hingho, right? And the Hatizungi Moran, they, they were also rebelled against the Ahoms. So they set up Harbananda as their king in the territory to the east of Dihing River. And both Bharat Hingha and Harbananda minted coins in their names, right? Then the Ahom administration was shifted to Disoy. Disoy is present day Jorhat, right? And from Disoy, actually, Purnananda Borhaguhai, he continued to fight against the Muamoria rebels. And at that time, actually, there were some localized revolts in other places as well. Say, for example, the Krishnanarayan of Dorong region, he rebelled and occupied North Guwahati. And also, several chiefs of local territories, they declared independence. And finally, Gorinath Hingo felt helpless and he had to sought the assistance from the British East India Company. Right? So when Gorinath Hingo felt helpless, he appealed to British East India Company for the help of men and materials. And by that time, actually, the British East India Company has arrived in India and started its operation, right? And he made the appeal through Salt Marsen, Rouse and Commissioner of Coast Bihar, Mr. Douglas. And in, in response to the appeal of Gorinath Hingho, at that time, actually, Governor General was Lord Cornwallis, right? So he accepted uh, the proposal of Gorinath Hingha. He agreed to help him and dispatched Captain Thomas Wells with a huge British force to Assam or Aham Kingdom. Then Captain Thomas Wells Assam, uh, actually he arrived Assam in the Gualpara region in 19, sorry, 1792, right? So this year is very important. In which year Thomas Wells came to Assam, then the answer will be 1792. And at that time, the Governor General was Lord Cornwallis, right? And the rest of India was basically under the British East India Company rule. Then the meeting between Gorinath Hingo and Captain Wells took place in Nagarbera on the bank of Brahmaputra. And this Nagarbera region, it is now currently located in the Kamrup region, right? Now let us discuss the operation of Captain Thomas Wells in Assam. So first of all, he suppressed the rebellious elements at Guwahati and on the North Bank. Then he pacified Dorongi Raja Krishna Narayan and expelled many Borkandas soldiers who was assisting Krishna Narayan. So Borkandas were basically hired North Indian soldier and they were actually expert in running or actually functioning of cannons, right? Borkandas. Uh, then Captain Wells arrived at Jorhat and finally he arrived at Rangpur. Then he defeated the Muamorias in Rangpur and restored the authority of Gorinath Hingha in the year 1794. So here you can see Captain Wells arrived in 1792. Then he actually he defeated the Muamorias of Rangpur in 1794, right? And soon after the victory, actually Captain Wells left Assam. He went back because he was recalled by the new governor general, Sir John Shore. So Captain Wells was sent by uh, governor general Lord Cornwallis and he was recalled by Sir John Shore. So this kind of information are very important, right? Try to remember them. Now during the reign, uh, sorry, during the stay of uh, Thomas Wells in the Ahom Kingdom, he concluded a commercial treaty with Gorinath Hingha in the year 1793 and by that treaty actually the commerce between ahom kingdom or assam and bengal it was started on reciprocal basis and captain thomas wells he had also prepared a report and submitted it to the government so actually that particular report of thomas wells it contained important information in regard to the administration of ahoms trade commerce and product etc right and regarding Gorinath Hingo, he was very cruel and very much vindictive, but he did some good work as well. So at that time, actually in the Hodia region, there was a Hokti pit called Kesai Khati Temple or also called Tamreshwari Devaloy, right? Tamreshwari Devaloy and it was a Shakti pit and human sacrifice was practiced, right? So Gorinath Hingo abolished the human sacrifice. 
सो इन आसामीज इट उल वि लाइक दैट गौरीनाथ सिंह नरबलि प्रथा बंध कर बंध कर खाटी मंदिर तमरेश्वरी देवालय और सही तमरेश्वरी देवालय तो आज शदिया शदिया सो फाइनेलि इन दर सेवेन्टीन नाइन्टी फोर गौरीनाथ सिंह पार्मेन्टलि शिफ्टेड द आहोम केपिटल टू डिशोय देट इज लोकेटेड इन जोरट राइट द रेन अफ कमलेश्वर सिंह सो गौरीनाथ सिंह डायड इन दर सेवेन्टीन नाइन्टी फाइव एंड हि वज सक्सिडेड बै कमलेश्वर सिंह एंड कमलेश्वर सिंह बेसिकली लेफ्ट द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन टू द मोस्ट एफिशियंट आहोम अफिशर पूर्णानंद बुढ़ागोह राइट सो एज आई हेव अलरेडी मेनशन हि गट एपमेंट ड्यूरींग द रेन अफ गौरीनाथ सिंह राइट सो एनीवे ड्यूरींग द रेन अफ कमलेश्वर सिंह देर वेर मेनी लोकेलाइज रिवल्स दोज लोकेलाइज रिवल्स वेर बै खामतीज पानी नरा मिरी देन द मोआमरिया रिवल्ट एलंग उथ द दफलास एटसेट्रा बट अल दोज रिवल्स वेर सकसेसफुली सप्रेसड देन ड्यूरींग द रेन अफ कमलेश्वर सिंह ए भेरी नोटेबल रिवल्ट टूक प्लेस इन कमरूप एंड देट वज नोन एज डोडुआ ड्रु सो बेसिकली ह्वाट इज डोडुआ ड्रु सो इन कमरूप हरदत्त एंड बीरदत्त दे वेर टू ब्रदार्स राइट सो दे अर्गेनइज सम बरकांडज सोल्जार्स बरकांडज सोल्जार्स मीन्स दे वेर नर्थ इंडियन सोल्जार्स हू वेर एक्सपर्टुअल एक्सपर्ट इन फायरिंग कैनन्स और बर टूप राइट एंड हेन्स दे वेर नोन एज बरकांडज राइट But the local people, local people of that region, they called those soldiers as Dum Dumia, right? And hence this particular revolt was known as Dum Dumia Dro or Don Dua Dro. So this is the origin of the name Don Dua. Don Dua comes from the term Dum Dumia, which means the North Indian soldiers. So the important point is that the Don Dua Dro took place in the reign of Kamalasar Hingha. But the Dondua Dru was successfully repressed. So basically, it was repressed by Kolia Bhumura Borfukon, and he was another very efficient, you know, army commander. And since he actually repressed the Dondua Dru, he was offered the title Pratap Bolov by King Kamalasar Hingha. And then Kolia Bhumura Borfukon, he actually decided to build a bridge over Brahmaputra. near hilghat hilghat is located on the south bank of brahmaputra so basically he decided to connect the south bank of brahmaputra to the north bank of the brahmaputra river right so the plan was not executed however and that is why the second bridge of our brahmaputra that is kolia bhumra ketu it is named after kolia bhumra borfukon so you can see the relation between geography and history right so in the geography chapter i have discussed that kolia bhumra ketu it is the second bridge connecting tejpur and koliabor right and the kolia bhumra name comes from kolia bhumra borfukon under the reign of kamaleshwar hingha right and then in the year 1805 there was a fresh rising or revolt of the moamorias under harbananda hingha so initially it was under moran uh, chief nahar and raghav hoykia right so if you can remember uh, then the muamorias also brought burmese army for assistance but purnanand was very efficient man as i have already mentioned so purnanand actually bribed the burmese army and sent them back so here you can see that purnanand borguha actually tried to protect the ahom kingdom in various ways right then finally purnanand burhaguha concluded a treaty with the muamorias and they finally settled in between the region between brahmaputra river and burhidhing river and that particular territory or area is later known as motok rajya or motok state and the chief of motoks were given the title bor khenapati right then regarding public works kamaleshwar hinga connected the new capital jorhat by constructing several new roads like noali rajabahar ali mohbanda ali kamar bandha ali etc and this mohbanda ali noali are still existent in the present jorhat town right then kamaleshwar hinga had also built a copper house at kamaikha and he finally passed away in the year 1810 ad right then the reign of chandrakanta hinga so kamaleshwar hinga was succeeded by chandrakanta hinga right then he assumed the ahom name sudenfa 
and during that time actually Chandrakanta Hinga was very young and that is why the control of Ahom kingdom remained at the hands of Purnananda Burhaguhai and the reign of Chandrakanta Hinga was important because actually Burmese invaded Assam in that time right so actually in the initial period of Chandrakanta Hinga he developed a great friendship with Hotram. Hotram was a friend of childhood friend of Sandrakanta Hinga. But later he became very greedy and in fact he plotted assassination of Purnananda Burhaguhai. And that is why Hotram was captured and banished to Namro. Right? And by the same time actually Kolya Bhumura Barfukan passed away. And Bodan Sandra was appointed as the Barfukan of Ahom Kingdom. Right? And the appointment of Bodhan Sandra Barfukan was the most disastrous or wrong decision for Ahom Kingdom because Bodhan Sandra is responsible for the Burmese invasion to Assam. So now let us discuss the Burmese invasion. The first one took place in the year 1816. So how actually it took place? How did it happen? So Bodhan Sandra Barfukan was very very corrupt. And that is why soon conflict was developed between Purnananda Burhaguhai and Bodhan Sandra Barfukan. So, Purnananda Burhaguhai sent Ahom army or uh, men to arrest Bodhan Sandra. But he fled and he escaped to Calcutta. And in Calcutta, he sought British help to fight against the Purnananda Burhaguhai. But the British, they refused to intervene. Then what Bodhan Sandra did? So, he went to Kingdom of Ava or the Burma, right? And this is the present day Myanmar basically, right? So he went to take the help of Burmese, right? And basically he requested the Burmese monarch to fight against the Burhaguhai. So here you can see this is how actually an Ahom officer, Bodhan Sandra, invited the Burmese army to invade his own kingdom, right? So he is a betrayer, right? Then let us discuss the first Burmese invasion. So the Burmese monarch Bodopaya already had his eyes on Assam. So Bodopaya took the opportunity and he agreed to help Bodhan Sandra Barfukan. Then in the year 1816 AD, he dispatched or sent a huge Burmese army of around 16,000 men with Bodhan Sandra to Assam or basically to Ahom Kingdom. And it was the first Burmese invasion. 1816, very very important question from examination point of view in which year it took place 1816 and who is responsible then the answer will be Bodhan Sandra Barfukan and during which reign it took place then the answer will be Sandra Kanto Hingha right then when actually Burmese came to Assam or when actually they marched towards Assam Purnananda Burhaguhai sent a huge Ahum army to resist the Burmese army and by that time actually Purnananda Burhaguhai died of heart attack, right? And Purnananda, uh, the death of Purnananda was a big blow to Ahom Kingdom. Why? Because as we have already discussed, that actually Purnananda Burhaguhai had successfully administered or he successfully carried away the administration of Ahom Kingdom, right? So Purnananda's death was a great loss for Ahom Kingdom. And he was succeeded by his son, Rusinath Burhaguhai, right? Then the first battle of Ahom and Burmese took place at a uh, place called Ghiladhari Ghat. And in that engagement or battle, Burmese defeated the Ahom army. Then the Burmese army arrived at Jorhat. And on their line of march towards Jorhat, the Burmese army burned down thousands of Ahom villages and the villages of other communities. Right? So basically, they have started launching atrocities in Ahom kingdom. Right? Then the Burmese, they reinstated Bodhan Sandra as the Bofukan and he became very very powerful. And Sandrakanda Hinga, he was retained as a nominal king or vassal king and all relatives and adherents of Purnananda Burhaguhai was killed. Right? Then in the year, that means in the month April 1817, the Burmese army returned to their country. And along with them, they have taken away a Ahom girl named Hemu Aido and a huge amount of present. So they entered Assam in 1860 and then they returned in 1817. So this was the first Burmese invasion, right? Now the fall of Ahom Kingdom, right? So after the departure of Burmese army, 
that means after the first Burmese invasion, Borborua and Bodon Borfukon involved in frequent conflict, right? Then uh, the king's mother, Numoli Rasmao, Nirvoy Narayan, Borguhai, they also took the side of Borborua. And that is why finally, Bodon Sandra was assassinated or killed in the year 1818. So he was killed soon after the departure of the Burmese army, right? Then Rusinath Burhaguhai, he decided to place Brazonat Hingho in the Ahom throne, but he was inel ineligible, right? And that is why his son Purandar Hingho was chosen to, to the throne, right? Uh, then Sandrakanta Hingho was captured and mutilated and made ineligible for further accession to the throne. So after Sandrakanta Hingho, Purandar Hingho actually ascended the Ahom throne, right? Then let us discuss the second Burmese invasion. So when Baran Sandra Barfukan was assassinated, the news reached to Burmese monarch, right? So this time he sent another huge force under Alumini and they reached Assam in February 1819. So the first invasion took place in 1816 and the second invasion took place in the year 1819, three years after. And this is the second Burmese invasion. And the first battle took place near Nazira and initially Ahom army was successful to resist the Burmese army but later they got defeated and the Burmese army advanced up to Jorhat, right? Then when they reached Jorhat, Purandar Hingo and Rusinath Burhaguhai, they fled to Guwahati. Then Purandar Hingo reached Calcutta and appealed help from the British East India Company to assist him but they refused, East India Company refused to help Purandar Hingha, right? Uh, then the Burmese army reached uh, Ahom uh, capital again and Sandrakanta Hingha was restored to the throne. But he was only the nominal ruler and the real authority was vested on Burmese army commander, right? Although Sandrakanta was made king again, but the real authority lies on the hands of Burmese army commander, right? And in the year 1819, Alumini returned to Burma again. But some Burmese soldiers remained in Ahom Kingdom under Mingi Maha Tilua. So the name of the Burmese commanders are also important. Mingi Maha Tilua, right? And Alumini, etc. Alumini was the commander in the second Burmese invasion, Alumini. Then after the departure of the Burmese army, Sandrakanta Hingo secretly started erecting a fort at Jaipur to prohibit or to actually prevent the further Burmese invasion and the construction of that particular fort at Jaipur was supervised by Patal Borborua and Jaipur is basically located in the Dibrugar district at present, right? Then comes the third Burmese invasion. So in the year 1821, Burmese monarch Bagi Dev, first in the first two invasion actually the king was Bodopaya and in the third invasion the Burmese monarch was Bagi Dev, right? So Bagido actually sent a Burmese army force with presents uh, consisting of ornaments and dress to Sandrakanta Hingha. But when the Burmese force reached near Zoypur, they saw the preparation for the fort or they have seen the construction of the fort and they got angry and they then they killed Patal Borborua, the supervisor of the fort, right? And when actually uh, the Burmese army killed Patal Borborua, Sandrakanta Hingha got afraid. Right? And that is why he fled to Guwahati in the year 1821. Right? So the third invasion took place in 1821. First 1816, then 1819 and finally 1821. Then the Burmese army tried to convince Sandrakanta Hingha but Sandrakanta Hingha didn't return. So in the year 1820 the Burmese placed Zugeshwar Hingha as a nominal king in the Ahom throne. But again, the real authority was vested on the Burmese commander Mingi Maha Tilua, right? And then Sandrakanta Hingha crossed the border and entered Bengal. He entered Bengal. And in Bengal, he started collecting arms and men to fight against the Burmese army. So this was the third Burmese invasion, right? Then in 1822 AD, this was the last battles, right? So Mingi Maha Bandula also arrived in Assam with a large enforcement. So Mingi Maha Tilwa is already there. 
So in April 1822, the Battle of Mohgaur took place between Sandrakanta Hinga and the Burmese army, but Sandrakanta Hinga was defeated. Then again in June 1822, in the same year, uh, two months later, Sandrakanta Hinga had again engaged in a battle with the Burmese, and it was the last battle. It, it took place in that in the place called Hadira Soki, right? So the battle of Hadira Soki was the last battle between Ahom and Burmese army. But in the battle of Hadira Soki, Sandrakanta Hinga got defeated. Actually, he fought with exemplary bravery, but he was defeated only due to shortage of ammunition, right? So after that battle of Hadira Soki, the Burmese army formally took over the Ahom kingdom and Sandrakanta Hinga fled to Bengal, right? So now let us discuss the period of Burmese rule in Assamese. It is called Manordin or Manor Upadrev, right? So Burmese, they are called Man in Assamese. In the Assamese history book, you will find the term Manor Akraman, Manordin, etc. So the period starting from 1821 up to 1824, it is called the period of Burmese rule in Assam. So during this period, actually, the Burmese army devastated the complete a home kingdom and they actually launched different type of atrocity atrocities like killing of innocent people people were burned even alive then some portions of their bodies were also cut off alive so you can see their actually atrocity level was very high right and their operation was so horrific so terrific which cannot be described even in words right so that was the manordin and in addition to the Burmese or the man the Singh force, the Singh force are basically the tribe, hill tribe, uh, they are located in the Arunachal Pradesh at present, right? Singh force also allied with the Burmese and Singh force also made constant raids in Ahom Kingdom. And in fact, they carried away helpless people as their slave, right? And since uh, that particular Burmese, period of Burmese rule was very terrific, after so many years, people remember Manordin or Manorapodrav with horror. So it was a very horrific period, right? Ba Manordin or period of Burmese rule from 1821 up to 1824. Now let us discuss the friction or conflict between Burmese and Brit uh, British. So after Burmese you know, took over Ahom Kingdom, they started demanding the surrender of refugees like Sandrakanta Hingha and his supporters. And in that time, actually, the border conflict in the East India Company's Chittagong's frontier with the Burmese Empire also took a serious turn. And since Bengal was the most prized position of British East India Company, so finally, Governor General Lord Amherst decided to fight in order to protect Bengal, right? So Governor General Lord, uh, Lord Amherst, he declared war against the Burmese on 5th of March 1824, right, against Burma or Myanmar, and the command was given to General R.C. Beld Campbell. This is very important, who was the commander or supreme commander of the Anglo British, uh, sorry, the Anglo Burmese war. Then the answer will be General R.C. Beld Campbell, right. So now let us discuss the Anglo Burmese war. So this is the first Anglo Burmese war which lasted for around two years. So first of all, the British army entered Gwalpara frontier of Assam and they defeated the small Burmese garrison in Lower Assam and advanced towards Upper Assam, right? So first Lower Assam, then Upper Assam. Then the British army in Brahmaputra Valley was basically led by two groups, right? It was, it was divided into two groups. So they were basically led by a civilian. Civilian means basically he is the agent of Governor General. He was David Scott, right? And he was the first commissioner of Assam, right? David Scott, then Colonel Richards. So they were military officer and Captain Newbill. So at first, British troops actually occupied Moramuk. And Moramuk was the main establishment of the Burmese army. Then on January 21, 1825, the British army had occupied Rongpur. And martial law was declared. Uh, then David Scott was appointed as the civil officer in charge of civil matters and Colonel Richards in charge of the army. So finally, they were able, the British army were able to defeat the Burmese army in 
Assam or Ahom Kingdom in, in 1825, right? Then in the year 1824, Colonel Inns, actually he took the help of Manipur, Manipuri King Gombe Singh and he had driven out the Burmese army from Manipur as well. Then in the year 1825, in the month of June, Captain Newville defeated the Singh force as well. And the Burmese were expelled from the Singh force state and Singh force submitted. And in that particular mission, Captain Newville rescued around 6,000 Assamese captives. So in my previous lecture, uh, previous slide, I have discussed that during the period of Burmese rule, the Singh force were their friend. And Singh force also made raids and they carried away Assamese people as their slave. So around 6,000 Assamese slaves were rescued by Captain Newville. Then apart from the mission in Assam and Ahom Kingdom, the British army also invaded Burma, right? So they reached Burma and in the famous Battle of Yangon and Battle of Prom, the Burmese army were badly defeated. And in the history book, you will find the term, the Kingdom of Abha, right? At that time, it was known as Kingdom of Abha. And actually a detailed account of this particular Anglo-Burmese war is given in this particular book, Narrative of Burmese War, written by Wilson, right? Now comes the Treaty of Yandabo. So by 1826, all the Burmese army in Assam and nearby areas were driven out. So British army driven out the Burmese, defeated and driven. Then finally on 24th of February 1826, a Treaty of Peace and Friendship was concluded between British and Burmese. That means, to be precise, the treaty was concluded between East India Company and King of Ava. Right? Very important. King of Ava and East India Company to be specific. And this particular treaty was signed in Yandabo. It is a place in the Ava Kingdom and presently it is located in Myanmar. Right? So Yandabo is basically a place. And by this treaty of Yandabo, the Burmese monarch or the king of Ava, he renounced all the claims upon and also promised to refrain from the interference with Assam, Manipur, Arakan and also recognized Gambhir Singh as the Raja of Manipur. Right. So this is the treaty of Yandabo. Then British kept Assam under its occupation and it was constituted as a province of Assam and British administration was introduced by David Scott. So this is about fall of Ahom Kingdom, then Treaty of Yandabu and finally the British rule started. So now let us discuss some chronology of important events in the Ahom rule. So beginning of Ahom rule by Sukafa in 1228 AD. So these years are very important and that is why I have mentioned it, right? Then the first Ahom Mughal conflict during the reign of Pratap Singha in 1527. Then invasion of Turbuk or Turbuk or Ahom Akraman. And in that actually battle, uh, Mula Gavoru also fought, right? Mula Gavoru was a lady and it took place during the reign of Suhungmung. Then Kos Hazo annexation by Mughals, it took place in 1613. Then Mirzumla's Assam invasion, very important. It took place during the reign of Joydo Singha in 1662 AD. Then comes Treaty of Giladharighat between Joydo Singha and Mirzumla in 1663 AD, followed by Battle of Horaighat 1671 during the reign of Udaritya Singha. So many people actually they got confused whether it is Udaritya Singha or Sakrada Singha, but the answer is Udaritya Singha. Don't get confused. Battle of Horaighat Udaritya Singha. Then death of Zoymoti, 1680 AD and during the reign of Sulikfa, right? And Gorapani, Kumar or Godadar Gora, Hinga was her husband. Then Battle of Itakuli, the last battle between Ahoms and Mughals, 1682 during the reign of Godadar Hinga. Then Lotakota Ron took place during the reign of Rajaswar Hinga. All these are important. Every point is important. Please remember. Then the first Muamoria revolt or rebellion, 1679, in the reign of Lakshmihinga. Then Captain Wells' Assam uh, mission or operation, 1792, during the reign of Gorinath Hinga. Then Dondua Druh, led by Haradatta and Biradatta, in 1795, in the reign of Kamalaswar Hinga. And this Dondua Druh was suppressed by Kolia Bhumra Barfukan, isn't it? Then the first Burmese invasion. 1816, 1816, during the reign of Sondrakanta Hinga, 
Then Battle of Itakuli, it is the last battle between Ahoms and Mughals, took place in 1682 during the reign of Gwadadar Hingha, Lotakota Ron, reign of Rajasar Hingha, then first Muammaria revolt took place during the reign of Lakmi Hingha in 1679, then Captain Thomas Wells Assam mission took place in 1792 during the reign of Gorinath Hingha, then Dondua drew led by Harajatta and Virajatta in the Kamrup region, right? And it was it took, took place during the reign of Kamalashtar Hingha in 1795. Then the first Burmese invasion. So basically the Burmese force was sent in the year 1816. But it had entered Assam in 1817. And that is why the first Burmese invasion is considered to be in the year 1817. Right? And it took place during the reign of Sandrakanta Hingha. Then the second Burmese invasion in 1819. The third invasion in 1821 and the last one the treaty of yandabu took place between or it was signed between british east india company and king of ava or basically the burmese monarch king of ava please remember right so this is the chronology of some important events in ahom history so now let us discuss what kind of mcqs can be asked regarding uh, some history particularly based on Ahom history, right? So this type of question can be asked like the mission of Captain Thomas Wells to Assam took place uh, during the reign of which Ahom King? Then the answer will be Gorinath Hingha, right? B will be the answer. Then the Lotakota Rune take place uh, during the reign of which Ahom King? Answer will be Rajasar Hingha, right? In which of the following year the first Burmese invasion to Assam took place? Then the answer will be 1817 AD right so here is a confusion right or one confusion might be there that the burmese monarch bodopaya he sent the force from burma in 1816 but the burmese force entered assam in 1817 and that is why the first burmese invasion is considered as 1817 right so this is the correct answer then in which of the following place the last battle between ahoms and Burmese took place then the answer will be Hadira Soki and it took place between Ahom uh, Burmese force and Ahom King Sandrakanta Hinga Hadira Soki right then which among the following authors wrote the book Hosti Biddhanob then the answer will be Hukumar Borkait very common question it was written during the reign of Hibo Hinga following the order of Borraza Fuleshwari right Borraza Fuleshwari or Queen Fuleshwari, very important. Then which of the following book was written by Sihabuddin Talis? Then the answer will be Fatiyahi Abriya. So Sihabuddin Talis was basically, he accompanied Mir Jumla to Assam, right? And in this particular book, he had actually provided a brief account of the Ahom Kingdom as well as the invasion of Mir Jumla, right? Fatiyahi Abriya by Sihabuddin Talis. First of all, let us discuss the Ahom system of administration. So the system of government in Ahom kingdom was partly monarchical and partly aristocratic. So monarchical means controlled by the kings and aristocratic means they are controlled by the high officials or nobles, right? So the king or Sargadev, he was the supreme head of Ahom kingdom or Ahom state and all honors titles, offices, decisions, and war measures originates from him. So similar to the President's Office of India, right? All honors, titles, then war measures originates from the President of India. So uh, the Ahom Kingdom was similar to that. Then there were several establishments or clans of princes, right? And clan means in Assamese, they are called Foid, right? Foid or faction or clan, right? So there were several foid or clan and that system was introduced by King or Sargadev Suhungmung. And those establishments were like Saringya, Tipomya, Tungkungya, Dihingya, Samaguriya, Parbatiya and Namrupya. So basically these are named after some places like Saring, Tipom, right? Then Dihing, Dihing means on the bank of Dihing river, right? Then Samaguri region, then Parbatiya region and Namrup region, right? And Suhungmung himself belonged to the Dihingya Foid, right? Or Dihingya clan. 
and that is why he is known as Dhinya Raza, right? And each of these princes or Ahom Kumars, basically in Assamese, you will find the term Kumar, right? So each of these Kumars or princes had their own estates and dependents. And all of them, all the princes belong to the Ahom royal family and they were given the title Raja. They were given the title Raja. Say for example, Namrupya Raja, Tipomiya Raja, Dihinya Raja, etc. Right? Now, in the early days, Ahom rule of succession devolved from father to son with great regularity. But later, king's brothers also started succeeding. Say for example, in case of the sons of Rudrahinga, right? So first, it, it was uh, actually ascended by Hibohinga, followed by Pramattahinga, right? So earlier actually, the succession devolved from father to son, but later it was, that particular rule was broken. Then there were two essential qualifications to become a Ahom king. First of all, no one could ascend the throne if he is not a prince of blood. So he should have a royal blood in his body right then the second condition is that there should be no noticeable scar mark blemish or defect in his body so these two were very essential condition for becoming a home king he should have royal blood and he shouldn't have any noticeable scar mark blemish or defect in his body and that is why a home kings often secures their thrones by mutilating rebelling princes right they are actually different parts of their body was mutilated in order to protect the thrones. Then the ceremony of installation was of great importance in Ahom Kingdom. And the king wore the traditional Somdeo. Homdeo or Homdeo means the image of their deity. And they carried Hangdang. Hangdang is the ancestral sword of Ahom Kingdom. Very important. Hangdang means sword. And also they entered Hingori Ghar during installation ceremony, right? Then the Ahom king acted according to the advice of three great counselors or ministers or simply they were called Guhai, right? Burha Guhai, Bor Guhai and Borpatra Guhai. So initially only two posts was, were there, Burha Guhai and Bor Guhai and these two posts were created by Sukafa. But later, Suhung Mung created the post of Borpatra Guhai and all of them were equivalent, equivalent post, right? And Konseng was the first Borpatra Guhai. And basically, these posts, Burha Guhai, Bor Guhai, Borpatra Guhai, these were hereditary in nature, similar to the king, right? But the king could also appoint others to this post. Then the provinces were also assigned to these three Guhais and where they can exercise their powers independently. So some provinces were also provided to the Guhais, right? Then Pratavhinga created the post of Borfukon and Borborwa to another high officials of Ahom Kingdom. Very important who created the post of uh, Borborwa and Borfukon. It is commonly asked in examination. Answer will be Pratavhinga. Then Borfukan was placed in charge of Lower Assam from Koliabor up to the western boundary with headquarters at Guwahati. So Guwahati was the headquarter of Borfukan. Then he was also the head of diplomatic relation with the West. West means basically Bengal, Bhutan, etc. And Borfukan possessed more independent power because he stayed in Guwahati much away from the Ahom capital, right? Then Borborwa. So Borborwa was placed as the head of the secretariat and judiciary immediately under the king. So basically, he was the chief executive officer of the entire western region of Ahom kingdom, Borborwa, right? Then Pratap Hingha created the post of Borfukon and Borborwa. Please remember this fact. Then Borfukon was placed in charge of Lower Assam or Western Assam from Koliabar up to the western boundary of Ahom Kingdom and his headquarter was in Guwahati and he was also the head of diplomatic relation with the west right particularly with the states like Bengal, Bhutan etc and Borfukon possessed more independent power because he stayed in Guwahati much away from the capital so basically he was the chief executive officer in the entire western region of Ahom Kingdom 
right then pratap hingo created a post of borfukon and borborwa another two high official post under ahom kingdom so borfukon was placed in charge of the lower assam region from koliabar up to the western boundary of ahom and his his headquarter is in guwahati and basically he was the head of the diplomatic relation with the west particularly with uh, bengal bhutan etc and borfukon possessed more independent power because he stayed in guwahati away from the capital and from the ahom king then borboro was placed as the head of the secretariat and judiciary immediately under king so he can be considered as the chief executive officer right and then this post borfukon and borborwa were not hereditary in nature unlike the three guhai so in my previous like uh, discussion i have told you that guhai this three guhai burha guhai bor guhai and borpatra guhai these posts were hereditary in nature that means the father is succeeded by his son but in case of borfukon and borborwa this is not so right so the king can appoint the eligible persons only then ahom king appointed local governors as that means the frontier officers such as hodia khwa guhai morangi khwa guhai holal guhai kazoli mukhya guhai etc so they were basically appointed for the administration of the outlying areas of ahom kingdom say for example for administration of hodia this post was created hodia khwa guhai then morangi morangi is basically the annexed territory of kosari kingdom right then comes hola kazoli etc then besides there were other position which were recruited from respectable ahom families for high post right and among those high post the highest rank was of the fukon six fukons were there in the ahom kingdom and they were known as somwa fukon so what are the six somwa fukon now boysa fukon bitorwal fukon then dihingya fukon then deka fukon very important mohendranath deka fukon he is a very important personality in modern assam mohendranath deka fukon right then no fukon neok fukon etc so basically these six fukons they form the council of borborwa and as i have already mentioned borborwa can be considered as the chief executive officer of ahom kingdom ceo right then there were six fukons in the council of borfukon as well say for example pani fukon then the next in rank were the borwas so there were around 20 borwas like dulia borwa say for example the jiuram dulia borwa jiuram dulia borwa he was a martyr right and he actually he that uh, his actually forefathers got this title from the ahom period right then pes borwa when we talk about besborwa the first name comes to our mind is the lakhminath besborwa so anyway besborwa title was given or besborwa post is for the traditional medicine practitioners then comes hati borwa so the hati borwa is they actually looked after or they managed the elephant supply in our home kingdom then there were 12 raskhwas and raskhwas commanded 3000 men and apart from these officials there were some other small posts like kotoki kotoki acted as agents or messengers then kakoti kakoti were writers and bhasha bhanga kakoti the term bhasha bhanga kakoti was used for translators right then doloi doloi practiced astrology then there is another post called bor doloi right so he was the chief doloi then boiragi he boiragi is acted as spy then count count supervised the cremation of kings and nobles so boiragis and counts they travel from places to place and provided valuable information to the ahom king so here you can see actually most of the titles which are present in assam now so they actually originated during ahom period so kakoti doloi boiragi khaun all them all of them were originated in the ahom period Then let us discuss the most important feature of Ahom Kingdom, that is the pike system. So pike system was introduced during the reign of Pratap Hingo, and basically it was structured and implemented in field by Mumai Tamuli Borborwa. And Mumai Tamuli Borborwa, he was the father of Lassit Borfukon, and he was the first Borborwa, right? Because Pratap Hingo created the post of 
Borfukon and Borborua and Mumai Tamuli was the first Borborua and this particular pike system it was the backbone of Ahom administration so in Ahom kingdom actually the revenues were not paid in case so instead of revenue actually the whole male population from 15 to 50 years they had to provide service for the nation or for Ahom kingdom right and they were called pikes so all the people who had actually who had to pay or provide service for the nation they were called pikes and this is the age range 15 to 50 years only and females are exempted from pike system very important information right then apart from that some pikes were also exempted from providing service under pike by paying taxes and they were called somua pike right then Boisnab Mohantas and the followers of Hotras were also exempted from the Pike system. Then the Pike, Pike means the individual, right? So the Pikes were organized into good, having three to four Pikes, and they were further divided into larger group called Khel. And 20 Pikes were commanded by a Bora. Then 100 Pikes were commanded by a Hoikya and thousand pikes were commanded by Hazorika. My title is also Hazorika, right? So in Ahom period, Hazorika actually, they commanded 1000 pikes. And as a reward for his services, each of the pikes were allotted two puras of best land for cultivation of rice. And one could also hold additional land by paying taxes or revenue. And the people who didn't cultivate, they had to pay taxes. Say, for example, the artisans, fishermen, brass worker, etc. Right? Then, army and law and justice of Ahom Kingdom. So, there were no separate standing army in Ahom Kingdom. And every active and efficient pike, they had to participate in battles as soldiers. So, this is a very unique feature. There was no army in Ahom Kingdom. So every population, that means uh, the every pike basically, they had to participate in the battles. And Mughal commander Ram Hingha admitted that every Assamese soldier was very expert in rowing boats, shooting arrows, digging trenches and cannons. And he didn't find such specimen of versatility in any other part of India. So basically Ram Hingha praised the Assamese soldiers, right? Then regarding law and justice, the criminal law was characterized by harshness, such as mutilation, then branding with hot iron, etc. Then in case of civil matters, traditional laws were followed and later Hindu laws were also followed. So in case of civil matter, customary laws were followed, right? Then let us discuss the customs and literature of Ahom Kingdom. So, during the reign of Sudangfa, Brahminical influence had its entry into a home royal place. Then Suhung Mung, he adopted the first Hindu name, right? Then Hoko era was also adopted during his reign. And Burunji were also written in Assamese during the reign of Suhung Mung. Very important information. Then Sukleng Mung, he was also known as Gorgoya Raja, right? And he was the first Ahom king to strike coins. Then comes Joydha Singha. He was known as Vagonia Raza because he escaped during the invasion of Mejumla, right? So, Joyra Singha is the first Ahom king to embrace Hinduism by receiving initiation from a Vaishnav priest. Then Rudra Hingha, Rudra Hingha put an end in the barring servant with the dead king in Moidams. And he also celebrated the Bihu festival in his royal palace and in the year 1694 he even invited young Bihu dancers to perform in Ranghar and Kobira Sakrabati was the royal poet uh, of his court. Then Hibohinga, so during the reign of Hibohinga, there was a growth of Hindu religious proclivities. Then during his reign Hunger Street tools were also established for learning and these were the books which were composed. Hukumar Borkait, Hostibidar Nob, Kobira Sakraborti, Hokuntola Kaibo, Ananta Asajo, Ananda Lahiri, Kobi Sandra, these Kam Kumar Haran and Thermo Puran. Then Gorinath Hingha, he abolished the human sacrifices in Tamreshori Temple or Kesai Khati Temple. Kesai Khati Temple or Tamreshori Temple in Hodia. Very important information. 
Now let us discuss some important Ahom capitals. So the first capital was established by Sukafa in Sor Soraideu region in 1253 AD. So Soraideu is the first Ahom capital. Then Suhungmung, Suhungmung had established the Ahom capital in Bokota. Bokota is located on the bank of Dihing river. Then Suklengmung shifted the Ahom capital to Gorgaon. Then Rudra Hingha established the capital in Rongpur. And finally, Gorinath Hingha shifted the capital to Disoy. So these are very, very important from examination point of view. There might be a direct question from each point. Say for example, which Ahom king established the capital in Rongpur? Then the answer will be Rudra Hingha, right? So try to remember all the key information. Now let us discuss the most important feature of Ahom kingdom that is their unique architecture so first of all let us discuss the important architectures of ahom kingdom so first of all uh, the ronghar ronghar is located in the rongpur right and ronghar is the royal sports pavilion with two stories and the royal family and the nobles they basically enjoyed sports like elephant fight buffalo fight and other performances from the ronghar and ronghar was initially built with wood and bamboo and thatch by rudrahinga but that got destroyed. Then the present day masonry Ronghar was built by Pramotto Hingo in the year 1746. Very important, 1746 Ronghar. Then the, wrong, uh, the playground in front of Ronghar is known as Rupohi Pothar. And King Rudra Hingo, as I have already mentioned, he invited young Bihu dancers in 1694 in, uh, to perform in this particular Rupohi Pothar. Right? And here, here you can see, this is the picture of Ronghar, right? And this is the spelling in Assamese, Ronghar. And these are the actual platform from where the Ahom kings and nobles enjoyed the fights. And this is the field where actually bullfight, elephant fight took place, right? Then comes the Tolatal Ghar. So it is, it is located in Rongpur, right? And it is located near to the Ronghar. And it was the royal palace of Ahom kingdom and it was constructed in the period from 1751 to 1769 by Rajasar Hingha. And this particular Tolatal Ghar, it is said to have seven stories, four above the ground and three below the ground. And it is said that the Tolatal Ghar had two underground tunnels to the Khor River and one to Gorgaon Palace or Karang Ghar. But however, at present only three overground stories can be seen and this overgun storage consists of 36 chambers and this particular Tolatal Ghar is enclosed by three rampers Bas Ghar, Bhitar Ghar and Tola Ghar and here you can see this is the picture or image of the Tolatal Ghar right and it is considered to be the largest monuments of Ahom age right so it is spread over a large area basically then here you can see this is the Karang Ghar also known as Gorgaon Palace because it is located in the Gorgaon in Najira, present day Najira. And it was the royal palace constructed in 1752 by Rajasar Hingha. And there are four overground stories one, two, three, and four, right? Then the Namdang Stone Bridge. So this particular bridge is curved out from a single solid rock over the river Namdang and it was constructed in 1703 by Rudra Hingha. Then comes the Moidams. So Moidams are basically pyramid like burial tombs of the members of the Ahom royalty. And the best known Moidams are located in Soraido, around 40 Moidams. And Moidams of Lasit Borfukon, uh, Lasit the great warrior, his Moidam is located in Holungapar in Moriyoni. And also, uh, the Moidam of King Purandar Hingha and Purnananda Burhaguhai, these are located in Jorhat. Then comes Hibohagar Tank and Hibohagar Dol. So, Hibohagar Tank was dug or excavated in 1734 by Queen Ambika, mainly to commemorate the victory of her husband, Hibohinga. And on the bank of Hibohagar Tank, three temples are located. Hibo Dol, Bisnu Dol and Debi Dol. Very important information and these dolls are still existent in the Hibohagar city, in the heart of the Hibohagar town or city. Then Gori Hagar Tank or Temple. So Gori Hagar Tank was excavated during the reign of Queen Fuleshwari and it was dedicated to Goddess Durga. Then Rudra Hagar Tank and Temples. 
So it was built in 1773 by King Lakshmi Singha in memory of his father, King Rudra Singha. Uh, then comes Joy Hagar Tank and Joy Dol. So these were actually excavated by Rudra Singha in memory of his mother, Joy Moti. And Rangna Dol, Haragori Dol, Gori Bollab Dol, and the Fakwa Dol. So Fakwa Dol basically it is the burial place of Joy Moti, right? So all these were constructed by Rudra Singha and the subsequent rulers near the Rangpur area, right? So here you can see this is the Joy Dole and here you can see these are the Moidams or burial tombs of the Ahom kings and other nobles. And here you can see this is the Hibohagar tank and here you can see these are the temples Joy Dole, Hibo Dole are located, right? Now let us discuss some Ahom monuments and public works in Jurhat. So these information are actually not easily available and that is why I am providing it to you. So the roads in Jurhat during a home age are Seuni Ali, by Zoido Singha, Khorikoti Ali, Mohabandha Ali, Kamarbandha Ali by Kamalaswar Singha. Then temples, Gorokhya Dole is in Jurhat, very important and it was constructed during the reign of Hibo Singha. Then comes the tanks like Rajma Pukhuri, Mitha Pukhuri, Bangal Pukhuri, all those were constructed or excavated during the reign of Sandra Kanto Hingha. These Bongal Pukhuri and Mitha Pukhuri, these are still existent in Jurhat town. Then ramparts, Lahdoigor, Mohgor, constructed by uh, Potap Hingha. And also there is another Gor called Borgheta Gor. Then comes Moidams, the Raja Moidam. Are located, Raja Moidam means the Moidam of Kamaleswar Hingha and Pur Purnananda Burhaguhai. Then as I have already mentioned, the Moidam of Lasit Borfukan is also located in the Morioni region of Jurhat, particularly to be specific, the region is Holunga Par, and there is also a wildlife sanctuary in the Holunga Par region, right? Now, let us discuss the public works of Ahom kings, and it will help you to remember the fact in a better way. Suklangmung, Gorgoya Tank, and Nogali, then Godadar Hingha, he built the famous or the famed Dudorali, Okali, and two stone bridges, and he also initiated land survey. Then comes Rudra Hingha. He constructed Joy Hagar Tank and Joy Dol. Then masonry bridges over Namdang and Digmo River. Then Meteka Ali and Khorikoti Ali. And he completed the land survey initiated by his father Goradar Hingha. Then comes Hibo Hingha. Please remember Dhai Ali, Razma Pukhuri, Kalugayan Pukhuri. Then survey in Kamrup and Bokota and recorded in Perakagaj. Then during his reign, Boraza Fuleshwari, she constructed the Gori Hagar Dole and Gori Hagar Tank, then Boraza Ambika, she excavated Hibo Hagar Tank, and Hibo Dole, Vishnu Dole, and Devi Dole were constructed on the bank of Hibo Hagar Tank. Then comes Pramatta Hingha, he constructed the masonry Ranghar, and also new masonry buildings and gateways are constructed at Gorgaon. Then Rudreswar and Hukreswar temples at Guwahati. Right? Kings and their corresponding public works. Very important slide. Please try to remember, right? Then Pratap Hingha, he constructed Hibo temples in Dergaon and Vishwanath and the Mesa Ghorar Pukhuri. Then Rajaswar Hingha, he constructed Karang Ghor in 1752 and Talatal Ghor, it was completed in this period, 1759 up to 1769. Then he constructed doles in Bokhistasram, Manikarnesar and Nabograhan also in Negheting. And finally, Lakshmi Hingha, he constructed the Rudra Hingha uh, tank and the Bogi Rajmao Pukhuri and also the Rudra Hagar Dole. Now let us discuss the characteristics of Ahom monuments, some important characteristics. So at that time actually the artisans of Ahom kingdom were not too much skilled. So for the building which were basically made of brick, artisans were mostly brought from Bengal, right? And in the brick buildings, instead of cement, a particular mixture was used as a binding agent. And that particular mixture comprised of egg, egg means coni, then brali mass, matima, black gram, borasal or waxidized, etc. So a mixture was composed of this particular component and these were actually used for the construction of brick monuments and lime was applied in the wall of monument right lime means soon 
Then another important feature of Ahu Maze Tank is that the water level of the tanks remain higher than the surrounding places. And for the construction of tanks, an expert known as Mati Selaka was used to test the soils. Right. So here you can see the Ahum administration was very much systematic. And also mercury was used for the construction of the tanks. And mercury was known as Roho or Roh. Right. Roho or Roho. Now let us discuss the last part of Ahom Kingdom. Here I will provide the chronological order of the Ahom Kings. Very important slide. Sukafa, he established the Ahom Kingdom in 1228 AD, then he died in 1660. Now let us discuss the last part of this particular lecture. Here I will provide the chronology of Ahom Kings. Sukafa, he has established Ahom Kingdom in 1228 AD and he passed away in 1268. Then he was followed by Suteufa, Subinfa and Sukhangfa. Followed by Sukrangfa and Sutufa. And Sutufa was killed by a Sutia king in a friendly encounter in Dikho river. Then comes Tauhamti. Then comes Sudangfa. Sudangfa was also known as Bamuni Kuar. Why Bamuni Kuar? Because he was born and brought up in a Brahmin family. Then comes Suzangfa and Sufakofa and Susenofa. Then comes Suhenfa and Supemfa. Their reigns were not that important. Then comes Suhungmung. And during the reign of Suhungmung, the real expansion of Ahom Kingdom started. And he was also known as the Hingya Raja. Then he was followed by his son Suklangmung, also known as Gorgoya Raja because he shifted his capital to Gorgaon. Then comes Sukhangfa or Khura Raja or Lame King. Right. Then comes Pratap Hingha. So during the reign of Pratap Hingo, actually the conflict between Ahoms and Mughals started. He also introduced the pike system and he also created the post Barfukan and Barbarua. Then comes Suramfa or Bhaga Raja. Then comes Sutianfa or Noria Raja. He often fell sick and hence the name Noria Raja. Then comes Joydha Singha. He is known as Bhaganya Raja because during his reign, Mirjumla invaded Assam and Joydha Singha escaped to Nam Namrup, right? Then comes Sakrada Singha, very important. Then comes Odaretto Singha, and during his reign, the famous Battle of Koraikha took place in 1671 AD, right? 1671 AD. Then comes the period of weak and unstable Ahom Kingdom. So, in that particular period, a large number of Kumars or princes occupied the Ahom throne. Ramdhas, Suhung, Gobar, Suzinfa, then comes Sudoifa or Parvatiya Kaur, and then comes the Sulikfa or Lora Raja. And during the Lora, uh, reign of uh, Lora Raja or Sulikfa, Joy Moti was put to death. And he is known as Lora Raja and Pratap Hingha, he is known as Burha Raja. So please don't get confused. Then Godadar Hingha or Godapani Kuar, then he was followed by Rudra Hingha, the most successful Ahom king, Rudra Hingha, right? He was the son of Joymati as well. Then comes Hibok Hingha, Pramatta Hingha, Rajeshwar Hingha, Rajesh Pramatta Hingha constructed the Ranghar, the masonry Ranghar, right? Then comes Rajeshwar Hingha, he had built the Karenghar and Talatalghar. Then Lakshmi Hingha, during the reign of Lakshmi Hingha, the Mua Moria revolt took place. Mua Moria. Here I am using the Assami spelling. The Mua Moria revolt took place. Then Gorinath Hingha, during the reign of Gorinath Hingha, the mission or apparition of Captain Thomas Wells occurred. Right? Then comes Kamaleshwar Hingha. During the reign of Kamaleshwar Hingha, the Dondua Druh occurred. Then comes Sandrakanta Hingha. He saw the first Burmese invasion in 1817. Right? Then comes Purandar Hingha. And Purandar Hingha is considered to be the last independent Ahom king. Then the Burmese army, they placed Sandrakanta Hingha for the second time. And after that, the Burmese made Jugeshwar Hingha the Ahom king. So, if we talk about the independent kings, then the last king will be Purandar Hingha. And if uh, we 
uh, consider the overall Ahom dynasty, then the last king will be Jogeshwar Hingha, right? So this is all about regarding the Ahom kingdom and I have covered the entire Ahom history. I think it will be helpful for you. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.